work with culture and um, bringing it here to Meridian is, is wonderful. I could literally call out everyone in this room today because so many friends are here and you've all played such an important role in bringing us together. And um, I just want to point out again, bringing culture to the forefront instead of an afterthought is I think the vision. continues to unfold and that is at the heart of Russia's brutal a war against the people of Ukraine. That's the assault on Ukraine's cultural heritage and their identity. Not only is Vladimir Putin attacking the people of Ukraine, but he's attacking their cultural heritage too. Within hours of Russia's launch on its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, teams across the State Department, including mine, came together to think about ways we could swoop into action, thinking about creative solutions and what more could be done to support Ukraine in the face of this unjust and unjustified war. Already for over 20 years, this is interesting, we've had a partnership and collaboration with Ukraine's Ministry of Culture. The United States supported Ukraine's efforts to strengthen and expand our cultural heritage protection and preservation capabilities during that time, over $1.7 million from the department's Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation has helped to safeguard and preserve Ukrainians' cultural heritage. This includes physical protection of sites and materials and items. We also established the Ukraine Cultural Heritage Response Initiative. This initiative provides over $7 million, four times the funding of the last two decades, to support documentation of damaged sites and collections for accountability, protection from damage and theft, emergency stabilization of damaged items, the development and implementation of conservation and restoration plans, cultural heritage response coordination, and specialized training. The United States and the State Department have really taken a 360 approach to supporting Ukraine, including cultural heritage. We've supported our embassy in Kyiv and the government of Ukraine in pinpointing American private sector support, such as the Uber Restore program, which literally has vehicles moving all across the country, filled with conservators monitoring Ukraine's cultural heritage from arts, antiquities, and article sites, and everything in between. When I heard about this project, I couldn't believe um, the efforts that were being made and how successful it was. Also want to highlight our team's work to support the creation of the independent State Department-supported Conflict Observatory. I know on the panel you'll hear much more about it. Richard Curran, I don't see him here. He's probably getting mic'd to come out onto this stage, but I see my good friend Aviva Rosenthal and they are so close to this work as an important research partner, and you'll hear more about it. But the project uses multiple data sources, including satellite imagery and social media analytics, to document autocracies committed by the Russian forces in Ukraine to hold the perpetrators accountable. We not only support on-the-ground partners, but also that allows us eyes in the sky to monitor cultural heritage sites. The sad reality is the Russian war is not only against the people of Ukraine, but it's about assaults on cultural heritage. According to the Conflict Observatory's data, this is evident. Culture is indeed in the crosshairs worldwide, but especially in Ukraine. I've listed a variety of ways we've highlighted what we in the United States are doing. Let me close simply by saying, as Secretary Blinken, you may have seen his remarks this morning, outlined 
in Helsinki, the newest member of NATO, President Putin's core aim in deed obsession has been to erase the idea of Ukraine, its identity, its people, its culture, its agency, its territory. While Putin has failed to achieve his aims, he hasn't given up on them. The United States, together with our allies and partners, is firmly committed to supporting Ukraine as long as it takes. Before we hear from the panel, and I am so si thrilled to see so many people show up this morning to hear this important conversation, I'd like to turn it back over to my friend, Ambassador Holliday. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> Lee, I'd like you to stay up here for a minute, and I'd like to, you to know, invite your cultural heritage team up as well. Uh, Assistant Secretary Satterfield, in recognition of the brave work being done by the State Department's Cultural Heritage Center, it is my honor to present you and your team with our Cultural Diplomacy Award. Thank you for your service to our nation and the world. Thank you very much. Now I'm pleased to introduce our, our first panel of the day, Culture in the Crosshairs, Protecting Cultural Heritage in Conflict Zones. This panel is moderated by Meridian trustee Deborah Lair, who's the CEO and managing partner at Edelman Global Advisory, a strategic business consulting firm based in Washington, DC. She's also the executive director of the Paulson Institute and the founder and chairman of the Antiquities Coalition, where she works with governments around the world fight against the illicit trade in antiquities. Welcome, Deborah. We have three uh, speakers joining us for this conversation. Uh, I think you will have their biographies, but I want to just say a brief word about each of them. Uh, we have Dr. Katerina Smogli. Welcome. Uh, she is Ukraine's first secretary of public and cultural diplomacy, a role in which she covers a broad portfolio of political and public diplomacy issues. She was previously director of the Kennan Center Institute's Kiev office. Dr. Richard Curran, who everybody knows, famous guy, <laughs> good to see you, uh, is an American cultural anthropologist who serves as the Smithsonian's distinguished scholar and ambassador at large, focusing on strategic initiatives, institutional representation, phil philanthropic support. He previously served for over a decade as the Undersecretary for Museums and Research, overseeing all of the Smithsonian's national museums. After the uh, Haiti 2010 earthquake, he worked uh, and founded the Smithsonian's Cultural Rescue Initiative, uh, which worked to save cultural heritage endangered by natural disasters and human conflict. You all can have a seat. And finally, Irina Bokova, who, Ambassador, Director General served as the Director General of UNESCO for eight years between November 2009 and 2017. She's the first woman and first Eastern European to have led that organization. She served uh, as Acting Foreign Minister of Bulgaria and as uh, Bulgaria's Ambassador of France, Monaco, and UNESCO. And as Director General of UNESCO, Irina actively engaged in international efforts to advance quality education for all, gender equality, and the protection of the world's cultural heritage as a humanitarian imperative. Without further ado, Deborah, I will pass it over to you. Stuart for hosting and Meridian for hosting such an important panel today on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart and looking at how we stop looting a cultural heritage or what we call combating looting. Or um, so Secretary, how Russia is very deliberately targeting sites in the Ukraine to try and erase the history that it doesn't agree with, or in targeting artifacts that it can sell for profit. 
we've seen this type of cultural genocide throughout history, but it's becoming much more prevalent in modern times with the advent of easy transportation around the world, express mail, secret um, email systems, and payment systems. And antiquities and theft in, in, in the past was not always looked at as a crime. But more and more we see that people are recognizing that this really is the theft of history, but also it is depriving people where many of these sites are often in some of the poor neighborhoods and sites of extreme uh, violence. One of the things that um, Arena has spent a lot of her time looking at that we're robbing people of their future economic opportunities by creating sites that can be used for tourism and other types of things. In recent years, we're pleased to see that institutions like the International Criminal Court have taken this issue up, that they have brought their first cases. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office in the last few years has set up an arts crime squad, which has been exceedingly active and found that many of our museums, unfortunately, have not necessarily paid the type of attention that they might to provenance. And we've seen, for example, with the Met, that they have had to return a number of pieces and that now we would look at them, and certainly under Richard's leadership at the Smithsonian, we have seen them starting to set a gold standard for the types of provenance research that should be done before artifacts are being um, purchased. We recognize that fighting this crime is really a very significant challenge for dealers, for the auction houses, for the museums, for the international institutions, even those that are set up to try and focus on it, and it's very tough to determine what's looted, how you handle non-state actors, um, especially internationally. But we're very fortunate to have, as Stuart mentioned, three people who really understand what is happening and in very real time as we're seeing in Ukraine. So we'd like to start first with Dr. Smugly to talk to us about what you're seeing on the ground in Ukraine. Thank you, Deborah, for this wonderful introduction. And first and foremost, let me thank uh, the organization that host us today, the Meridian, which have become a very strong uh, partner of our embassy and of Ukraine, which has already working on a number of uh, very important initiatives to promote better understanding of Ukrainian culture in the United States. So stay tuned. I hope that in this year and next year, there will be uh, wonderful opportunities for you to visit Ukrainian exhibitions which would be hosted here in Washington DC and in a number of um, museums all over the United States which are partners of the Meridian. And of course I would like to thank our wonderful assistant uh, secretary, Ms. Liz Satterfield, uh, who had provided incredible support. Every cultural and public diplomacy event that we host at the Ukraine House, by the way, those of you who have not yet been to the Ukraine House, you're very welcome. We have a Facebook page, we regularly host film screenings, book talks, public debates, uh, art exhibits. So for, for all of us here living in Washington, it is a wonderful opportunity to learn more about uh, Ukrainian culture. So uh, dear Assistant Secretary, thank you very much. And special greetings from Ambassador Aksana Markarova, who unfortunately couldn't be uh, here with us today due to conflict in her schedule. So the problem that we discussed today, I'm sorry, I, it sounds like I, my mic is not working properly because I have this echo. Maybe I should put it down a little bit. Um, the problem that we discussed today is, of course, of, uh, of tremendous, <laughs> tremendous importance. Uh, today is the 464th day of this horrific uh, war. Uh, we all remember the, the morning uh, of February 22 when uh, President Putin announced his decision to start what he called a special military operation and the shock that we all felt when uh, unimaginable became undeniable. The Russian army has tried so many tactics to make sure Ukraine surrenders. They tried the tactic of freezing us uh, last winter when they deliberately targeted our electricity grids, causing uh, electricity shut down, black, black, blackouts all over Ukraine, um, making people buy generators to heat the apartments, heat the private houses. It was a horrible, horrible situation. But of course, when you see 
images of destroyed libraries, of destroyed churches, of destroyed museums. Uh, as of today, we have 60 museums in Ukraine which have been either destroyed or looted completely, and we don't have the entire picture on the territories which are now under Russian occupation. Uh, the total damage in the field of cultural heritage caused by Russian actions have accounted to seven billion US dollars. And uh, we now talk a lot about uh, Rammstein in the sphere of security and defense, but certainly when the war is over, we'll have to think about educational Rammstein, cultural Rammstein, because without support of international community, Ukraine will not be able to rebuild and to restore all the heritage that it has lost as a result of Russian actions. Uh, with international community and with support of prosecutors who help us document Russia's war crimes, we have already documented 90,000 crimes of aggression and war crimes, and crimes against Ukraine's cultural heritage account to 1,500 of those. This is a huge number. Um, you probably saw the terrible images of Russian bombardment of the Mariupol Drama Theater with the signs children and next to it. This theater is now destroyed completely. Russians covered it to, to cover uh, the signs and, uh, of, of their crime. You probably heard about the destruction of our home, uh, memorial home of our philosopher. By the way, this year, celebrate his 300 years anniversary in the Moris So uh, for no reason, uh, and uh, Dr. Kurin knows this very well because the Smithsonian Institution helps us monitor uh, with digital images all the crimes that have been caused uh, by the Russian actions. So there was only one building in a village in the middle of nowhere near, near uh, uh, Kharkiv West where they specifically uh, targeted this uh, museum of which is completely destroyed. And that is why uh, Elena Zelenska, first lady of Ukraine, has initiated the project of collecting, fund, uh, collecting uh, funds to restore this museum simply because the figure of Grigory Skavrida is of a tremendous importance for Ukraine's uh, national memory and culture. There were looting of uh, Architectural Engine Museum, destruction of Maria Primachenka Museum. What I'd like to underscore is that Russian actions have not started last year. The destruction of Ukraine's uh, heritage, and cultural heritage, has started not, not only eight years ago when they next premier illegally in 2014 and uh, started military operations in the Donbas. Uh, we are deeply concerned about the destruction of Crimean Tatar uh, cultural heritage in Crimea. Uh, there are uh, construction works uh, on Tavrida Highway, as a result of which almost 100 uh, graves of Crimean Tatars have been destroyed. Uh, they started illegal reconstruction works in Bakhtisarai Palace. It's a very famous and the most, the oldest um, site of Crimean Tatar culture in the territory of Crimea. They regularly move uh, Ukrainian uh, artifacts and uh, paintings from Ukrainian museums in Ukrainian occupied territories to Russia. And um, again, uh, we had a meeting with Richard a couple of days ago and we, when he saw photographs made by Ukrainian uh, art professionals who still uh, live under the occupation, showing how in trucks you know, they just load huge number of uh, paintings, other uh, museum artifacts, and ship all of this um, uh, to Russian Federation. The fact that we discuss these issues today, uh, the, the fact that there is so much attention to Ukraine these days, uh, is to a large degree uh, depends on the actions of the Ukrainian army, which is fighting like lions and defending our uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. And uh, I always, in all the opportunities of public uh, communication that I have in numerous audience, I encourage all of us to fight on our own battlefields. And as cultural diplomats, as public diplomats, as people who value and love culture deeply, we have to fight 
for the cultural heritage of Ukraine, which is now under extreme danger. And by saying this, I mean that we have to truly learn and understand the history of Ukrainian culture, because as of today, we still see lack of expertise, true deep expertise in American universities, and not only American universities, all over the world. Because for many years, the nation of 40 million people was considered a kind of insignificant and not important, not deserving a place in galleries, museums, and public venues. Fortunately, again, if there is anything good that came out as a result of Putin's actions, Ukraine is finally on the map. It is, of course, a great tragedy that we had to uh, deserve the right to be discussed in such public venues with such a tragic uh, consequences for our nation. No other nation have to be faced uh, with the need to prove their identity and prove their agency in such a horrific way. But now that it is happened, and now that Ukraine is on the, on the map, I can only encourage everyone to support us in every little, or however little or big uh, thing that we can, and to continue fighting with us for uh, what we stand for, democracy, values, principles, human rights, um, and culture that we all have. Thank you. So well said, incredibly moving, and really showing how important it is that we all think about protecting our shared history. And in that context, Richard, it's not the first time that we unfortunately have heard these exceedingly sad stories of this type of cultural genocide. And we've seen this in Mali, you saw it in Haiti, we saw it with ISIS who even set up a ministry of extraction where they had oil at one part and antiquities at the other as a source of funding for their cause. What can governments do in these situations to both prepare and when they're in the midst of this? And what, what are you seeing on the ground in Ukraine? Well, um, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having me, and it's good to be with good friends and colleagues, uh, all of you here uh, this morning. Uh, uh, so I, I think the, what we see in Ukraine, I was just in uh, Mosul um, in Iraq two weeks ago, where we've been working on the, uh, the rehabilitation of the Mosul Museum. If you remember those images of ISIS guys with the sledgehammers shattering uh, statues and so on. And uh, you saw very much the same kind of thing, the obliteration of history and culture, the denial of people's identity. Uh, it's gone on through history. I mean, this is not something new, uh, but the technology of doing it <laughs> and the ability to cause destruction is, so, so we will probably spend, uh, we spend a lot of, many years already trying to put back together what ISIS blew up in a few seconds for a few hundred dollars. And I think going to Katya's point about Ukraine, the kind of level of destruction, you know, a missile, a bomb, it causes so much destruction, it's going to take years and years and really billions of dollars to, to uh, pick up. So the first thing we saw uh, on the ground in Ukraine was our colleagues, our cultural colleagues. Uh, you know, at the Smithsonian, I say, like, these are us. <laughs> this would be us. <laughs> And it was uh, museum people responding very quickly to try to pack up things, uh, to secure things. And people had to do it very quickly, even, even though the conflict was alive and it started in 2014, really. The, um, you know, the, the abruptness of it really caught people off guard. And all of a sudden, people needed boxes. And so we at the Smithsonian, we, got, we need boxes. We need bubble wrap. <laughs> we need plywood for windows. And I think the international community responded very well. Olive Foundation put in several hundred million dollars right away, within days. And working through uh, folks in Poland really supplied a lot of people. And the international community, many museums stepped up, Smithsonian stepped up. And, and people try to figure out a mechanism. And you have both in Ukraine, you have the public sector, the government, but you also have the NGOs. And both of them responded. So on the private side, uh, uh, you know, many people needed things, and the first thing, the, the biggest demand actually was fire extinguishers <laughs> because there were bombs going off and there were fires. So I think the international community bought up like every fire extinguisher in Europe, you know. And then as people packed up stuff and got, I got, I got a call one Saturday morning from one of the museums, it was a science museum in Ukraine. They said, we need to pack up 400,000 specimens 
Just think of that. Like, what are you going to do this weekend? Like, I think at the Smithsonian, like, pack up the American, the Natural History Museum. I mean, how do you do that? And so people needed things. And then as people packed up very quickly and put stuff away, then there was need for humidifiers and dehumidifiers because people were storing things underground and in places that didn't have climate control. And then later during the year, we'd get calls from people on the ground in, uh, uh, in, uh, um, in Ukraine, and UNESCO had organized, and ICRAM had organized these, uh, basically these conservation sessions where we'd get 200 people online directors, conservators, curators from museums in, in Ukraine, libraries, archives, say, there's no power, as Katya said, no power. How do we save stuff where you can have manuscripts that get frozen? And so one of the solutions was, okay, igloo coolers. <laughs> Let's get a lot of igloo coolers and put stuff in them, and it'll create micro environments. So I think there's, what I see is, you know, what governments need to do and what NGOs need to do and organizations need to do is one, preparation. <laughs> We're always playing catch up in this. So it's one thing, it's training of people being first responders. Now we were very fortunate in Ukraine, uh, there was the head of the uh, National uh, Maidan Museum, Mihor Poshavalo. He had been a Fulbright fellow, thank you State Department, he had been a Fulbright fellow at the Smithsonian when we were first responded to Haiti and the earthquake in Haiti, which wasn't you know, it wasn't a, a conflict, it wasn't a war, but you had some of the same things. How do you save thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of objects in the light of some kind of disaster? So he learned from that. He became one of our trainees. Then he became a trainer, and he started training cultural responders from around the world to interact. So we had somebody who had a depth of knowledge and experience who can gain from his colleagues, and he, he ended up in the sky of Vasil Reshko, organized the Heritage Emergency Response Organization in, uh, in, in Ukraine. It was great. And it was citizens defending their country, defending their culture. At the same time, we faced things with the National uh, Conservation Institute, which is responsible for the governor, government uh, collections, uh, 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 Svetlana Strelnikova and her unit. And they have great skill. But you know, conservators uh, are often like brain surgeons. You know, like at the Smithsonian, if you talk to a conservator and you say, how many objects did you work on this year? Well, you know, I worked on that Gilbert Stewart portrait of George Washington. You know, that took me all year. This is more like a mass unit where you're dealing with conservators that have to deal with hundreds of thousands, even millions of objects. So how do you gain that capacity? And they couldn't get to places. We made a deal with Uber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Uber t has, has now supported hundreds and hundreds of trips to do c conservation house calls around Ukraine so conservatives can take care of stuff. So you need preparation because we're always playing catch up. You need training and expertise. You need those ties to, I think, national and international organizations that can mobilize to help you. Uh, and then you need money. Then you need money. And I think, you know, we're always playing catch up, the international community, we always used to go, you know, can UNESCO do something? No, can the Ministry of Culture? And, and look, in Ukraine, you're dealing with the brutality of war. And it's gonna be armaments and self-defense, it's gonna be taking care of populations, you have to feed people, you want the kids to be able to go to school, you need health care, you know, so we're, culture's gonna be somewhere on that list. It's not gonna be number one, two, three, but it's like number seven or eight. <laughs> It's somewhere, and particularly in Ukraine, and particularly in Ukraine, where culture and identity and history is being targeted. This is not collateral damage. This is a forceful policy. We've now documented, to update Katya's figures, because we talked about this uh, yesterday or two days ago, 1600, we've documented 1,695 cases of potential damage to, and likely damage to museums, archives, libraries, and so on. And we go out and we confirm that by satellite photography and uh, on the ground uh, things. So, um, you know, it's, you need money to take, to, to deal with that. And it means the international community, State Department coming up with money. We got money from the Rockefeller Foundation, Omidyar, Bank of America, Mellon. It basically takes a village, <laughs> not a village, it takes a, war, a world to help secure culture. So those are, I think, the kind of elements that are needed, and that's whether the disaster is in Iraq, in Ukraine, in other parts of the world that we face. And, and 
And it will continue for the next 10, 15 years, right? Because we will start to see those artifacts then come into the marketplace. And then how we deal with it in that context will be the next wave. Well, as Katya said, you know, we have now, now on satellite photography. I mean, we've basically caught, you know, Russians red-handed. I mean, there's no, the, so Putin, what Putin did is he declared, you remember he made that de declaration last, um, I think it was like in October. He declared that there were four Ukrainian oblasts that were now part of Russia. He annexed them. And it was literally two weeks later, three weeks later, they sent trucks, semi-tractor trailer trucks, that we have them on film, <laughs> pulling up to the Kherson Regional Art Museum, on loading up two trucks. The reports are, you know, we couldn't count how many objects, but roughly about 10,000, 12,000 objects, put into that museum and hauled away. Now, that's a war crime. That's a violation of the 1954 Hague Convention. From Putin's point of view, he'd argue, well, I was just taking what's mine because I made it part of Russia, so I'm just you know, doing a little transfer between my own museums. That was a theft. And that's what we're documenting. We're working with the Conflict Observatory at the State Department. We'll work with the international community. We certainly work with the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture, reporting various things and following this up. And that will, that will be an effort that will go on for years. And it's a nice transition to ARENA, because you were head of UNESCO when we saw the Arab Spring and mass looting was starting in Egypt and across the Middle East, the rise of ISIS. And they very much use this cultural genocide as a way to target other religions and, and work we did at the Antiquities Coalition found that actually their biggest targets were their Islamic sites, not actually Christian sites, as were often re reported because it was destruction of parts of the religion they didn't believe in. And so as the international community, you really took UNESCO to a new level and created things like the blue hats of culture as an opportunity to protect. But what were some of the strengths that you saw, but also some of the weaknesses that we see in international law in dealing with a crisis like this? Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Deborah, and uh, so pleased to be here. Uh, thanks to the organizers of, uh, of this uh, debate. Uh, as you can imagine, it uh, resonates very deeply with my experience in those times. And um, thank you, Katerina, if I may, uh, for this uh, so moving uh, recount. Um, I, I think you once again uh, testify to the fact, uh, and to pick up from what Richard just said uh, at the end of his uh, presentation, that uh, attacks on culture are not just uh, um, a concern for uh, some art lovers or, or, or that it is something that has to be left for the better days. It is not a luxury that uh, we can afford. It is part and parcel of the response. I would like to see it not in the seventh place, uh, as you said, um, but uh, much higher uh, on, the, uh, uh, on this uh, uh, ranking, uh, because I think it's about identity of the people, it's about peace, it's about um, reconciliation with your own uh, identity. Uh, and this is my experience, because uh, you never asked me about uh, what my experience uh, in, on this is. Now, um, there are, of course, uh, certain challenges. I just put a couple, just a couple of slides to remind the audience about what we are talking about, uh, if you allow me, and then I will make some comments. I think it... If I may, uh, just uh, before uh, it all starts, um, what we have seen uh, in the last, uh, let's say, 20 years, uh, let's put it this way, when uh, the Bamiyan Buddhas were destroyed by the Talibans uh, in Afghanistan and then further on, uh, or maybe before, but it coincided a little bit with the wars in former Yugoslavia, the destruction of the, uh, in Mostar, the Mostar Bridge. Then, of course, came, as you said, uh, the advent of ISIS, uh, the cultural cleansing, as I, as I called it at the time, it testified to the fact that um, not just uh, there is a collateral damage uh, in a war, as, as Richard said, but it is parts and parcel of a war. Uh, it is mass atrocities always go with the destruction of heritage. And by the way, this is the title that I was very honored to participate recently in a project with the Getty Trust on mass atrocities and protection of heritage. And here you can see the bridge of Mostar. Uh, what, uh, it's an old Ottoman bridge. Uh, uh, it's uh, in uh, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. It doesn't have, it's a pedestrian bridge. 
it doesn't have actually a strategic kind of a uh, significance uh, because tanks cannot go there. So when it was uh, destroyed, uh, blown by, uh, by, by Serbia at that time, it was exactly to pass this message that there cannot be understanding and communication between the two communities. It was not for any military or strategic region. Then it was reconstructed under the auspices of UNESCO. And after that, it was inscribed on the World Heritage List, which is one of the very few exceptions on the World Heritage List of inscribing something that has been reconstructed, because usually it's about authenticity. It was the second case after the old town of Warsaw, Stare Miesto, and then it was reconstructed, inscribed, and the Bridge of Mostar was the second such example. Can we move on, please? Um, this is the celebration. Uh, of the inauguration of the bridge, uh, and then uh, it is not here. Uh, I went to the uh, 10th anniversary in 2014 uh, after uh, it was uh, celebrated, its inscription. Can we move on? We don't have much time. <laughs> this is the Bamiyan Buddhas, just a reminder of what we're talking about when they were destroyed. Uh, and uh, they were destroyed simply because they don't, they, they, the Taliban's, now they say it's not the Taliban's, it's Al Qaeda, I mean, all this. Uh, kind of a play of, of words that it was not them because they did not correspond to their understanding. It was iconoclastic uh, action that the Taliban's uh, did. Can we move on, please? And this is the way, uh, before, please, this is the way UNESCO was um, stabilizing uh, the whole, it was a decision after a lot of discussion with experts and others, it was not possible to uh, reconstruct it, it's rather to stabilize because still it's not uh, uh, at the back, uh, uh, it is uh, not very secure. Can we move on please? Now this is Mali, then came Mali, when the extremists occupied the northern part of the country, in the Sahel, and they started destroying mausoleums. These are Muslims destroying Muslim mausoleums, and I think this is exactly what Deborah you said. Uh, and they were destroying this once again because it did not correspond to their understanding. Of, I, I don't think it's a kind of a only a religious way of doing it, just to subjugate the population, to terrify them, to, to deprive them of their own identity, of their own story, of their own feeling of self-respect. Uh, and then, if you could move on the next uh, slide. Uh, it is also linked uh, to the destruction of, uh, and burning of manuscripts. Uh, this is where President, uh, that time President Francois Hollande invited me to join him and go when the extremists were pushed away. We are in Ahmed Baba Library uh, in, in Timbuktu, where uh, extremists uh, started destroying. They couldn't, but they burned still 3,000 manuscripts, and these manuscripts are holding in families from one generation to another. There are more than 100,000 in this particular library, but altogether about a million manuscripts there. Uh, and uh, we were just uh, horrified to see all this on the floor that were uh, burned. Next slide, please. So what we did, because there were uh, peacekeepers there uh, in Mali, at UNESCO we uh, decided to, uh, uh, to prepare to print a very small passport of, of, of heritage. This is a small one with all the major uh, uh, heritage sites and why they were important and to give 10,000 to put in every single peacekeeper in their pocket so that they're sensitized to the importance of heritage for the people and know how to protect it. Could we move then, please? And this is how also we started reconstruction. I remember when we were staying in front of one such mausoleum and President Hollande turned to me and said, Madam, Director General, can we do something? I said, yes, we will restore it. And once again, it was not exactly according to the convention where authenticity is major thing, but it is important, it was important uh, to uh, uh, rebuild it. I went when we were, uh, when we restored them, uh, and I, we had a very moving meeting with the local communities, with the local people, with the imams uh, that were there. And if you could move the next slide, please. And this is where the Minister of uh, Culture on, on, in the uh, yellow uh, on the right side and the, the, the Grand Imam of uh, one of the, the main mosques in uh, Timbuktu, uh, Jiring Gaber, he was receiving. And I had the feeling that I'm giving back the identity of these people. It was such 
a moving meeting with them. And I have not shown here a photo just to say, because Deborah mentioned uh, crimes. And then we went to the International Criminal Court, to the Chief Prosecutor for Tuba and Suda. We put two teams of legal teams, and we started working because I thought it's important that there is no such crime unpunished. And this is where the International Criminal Court took the case my deputy, Francesco Bandarin, for culture, went to testify. We put the two teams, and in 2016, we had the first convict who, uh, in court, he recognized, he admitted the crime that he has committed. Next slide, please. And then, of course, came Syria, the war in Syria. This is uh, also uh, Aleppo, how Aleppo looked. Uh, can we move then? Uh, this is uh, uh, Al-Askari Mosques in Samara, a bit earlier. Please, next slide. This is how it was restored, or before the, the destruction. Next slide, please. I'm talking too long. Uh, Asian city of Aleppo, the Souk, how it used to be and how it was uh, uh, destroyed. I didn't put here photos, but now Aga Khan Foundation restored it. And unfortunately, now with the earthquake, we don't know exactly what is happening there. Next slide, please. And we come to the question about the looting something that we worked very strongly, Deborah, with Antiquities Coalition at those times, and I'm sure UNESCO continues to work. It is about the illegal excavations, illegal trafficking. And when we say excavations, we tend to think that it is a very structured archaeological excavation. It is not. It is just hole in the ground. And those cr criminals, because I call them criminals, these groups, which were trafficking drugs, uh, uh, arms, uh, human beings, including uh, 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 antiquities, uh, they were profiting for that. And on the, on the left side, you can see what it used to be, on the right, what it is. And if you move the next slide, so this is what on the ground it is all about. It is a hole, and they were digging whatever they, no provenance, no inventories, no knowledge about what it is. Criminal groups trafficked and getting money to continue financing extremism, terrorism, and all this. Next slide, please. And of course, Palmyra. We know that it was one of the uh, outcry of the world when Palmyra was destroyed. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't know what is happening there and whether at all uh, something uh, can be done. Next slide, please. And then. We worked uh, here, I just wanted to put it, we worked with the Security Council. This is what the response to your question. It was very important to, to put the uh, uh, need to protect heritage, what Katerina was saying, uh, to the uh, uh, importance of humanitarian and security concerns. Uh, it is not enough only to protect people. You have to protect also their heritage and their identity. So several resolutions were adopted by the Security Council at those times. Uh, we worked very strongly with the Department of State <laughs> at that time. Um, some of the photos, uh, Richard, were provided by you, by the uh, US Geological Survey, working with UNITAR in the United Nations. And uh, the very important resolution 2199 was to stop the illicit trafficking and financing of uh, 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 extremism. And then, of course, if you could put the next slide, uh, it is the most important resolution, 2347, from 2017. For the first time, the Security Council took up this issue alone and said that the destruction of heritage is a war crime and should be stopped. There are many other things, but I think it was, it was very important. So I will end, um, if you could put the next. We launched, of course, the Unite for Heritage. We, we thought it's important to mobilize young people, mainly around the world on the social media, about why heritage is important. And the next slide, and I finish here. Uh, I have always thought that culture alone is not enough to build peace, but without culture, peace cannot be lasting. So thank you. Sadly, we are at the end of the panel. I'm, I'm sad because there isn't really time for questions. And I know that we could go on and on because you can hear the passion of so much of it. Oh, I'm being told we can have a question? OK, all right. Um, and I would just like to call out, you mentioned Yemen and Libya and the work that the State Department has done on Yemen and Libya in times of crisis with cultural MOUs and how important those are as a factor in this whole equation. And we hope, of course, that we'll see one with Ukraine as well and other creative ways to at least stop 
these antiquities, these looted antiquities coming into the U.S. But let me get one or two questions um, then for our team, if you have them. Questions? Okay. Oh, we have one in the back. Thank you. Hi, my name is Laura Ballman. I'm involved in Meridian uh, Diplomatic uh, Cultural Council. We're excited. I'm really excited to have such an esteemed uh, panel. Thanks. Can you comment on? Uh, what you think other for-profit entities can do? I mean, what Uber's doing in Ukraine is amazing. And sort of, what, do you see this as a model for future conflicts? And just any comments you have. Thank you. Richard, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, you know, Uber is, uh, has been happy. I mean, it's been ferrying refugees, you know, out of, originally out of Ukraine to, uh, to Poland. Uh, it's helped deal with um, uh, um, the relocation of various refugee populations. And we, when we suggested this role for them, they, they really grabbed at it. Uh, we found support from Bank of America, for example, for various things we're doing. I mean, the you know, corporate community kind of recognizes that, you know, they, they want, you know, stability. They want to do some good in the world. And, you know, it's finding the right way to appeal to them to do that. Uh, but we've also found foundations uh, step forward. Again, the, uh, our, our first money in, uh, in uh, with the Ukraine was, uh, was really the Rockefeller Foundation. Why did the Rockefeller Foundation come in? Well, Rajiv Shah had been the head of USAID when the Haiti earthquake happened. And in the, uh, in, when we and others uh, in the U.S. and internationally responded to Haiti, I mean, I, we sent 160 people to Haiti. We took over the U.N. building. We saved thousands of objects. We had a Haitian staff of uh, 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 about 50. Uh, we kept at it. We trained many Haitians. We restored the archives, libraries, and other things. USAID came in with that money. It was a very successful program. And so Rajiv Shah had shifted over to Rockefeller Foundation right after the invasion. You know, he turned to us at the Smithsonian and said, what are you guys doing in Ukraine? <laughs> because we had a good, we, it was a successful program. So I think people want to know that they can invest in something that is going to be helpful, that's uplifting. And I, I think, you know, everybody here believes, and I think, you know, both Katya, you said it with a lot of passion about Ukraine and uh, Arena on a world scale in what she's done uh, and, the, and really where she positioned UNESCO is that, you know, what is this about? This is about the dignity of human beings. This is, the, you know, their right to be who they are. This is about their identity. This is about a good thing. And so I think a lot of people want to be part of a good thing. That's what we're here for. And so we found the corporate world, the foundation world, individual philanthropists have come forward. Uh, and so it's a mixture. It takes government, it takes all those private sources as well to make something happen. One last question. Hi, my name is Sophia Hall, and I just wanted to say thank you for being here and speaking, and I was so moved by all of your words, and especially seeing the pictures on the screen of the destruction and then the hope with the reconstruction. I'm a poet at heart. I'm the DC Youth Poet Laureate. And I wanted to hear from you about what is being done to support the artists, the poets, the musicians that are creating art and culture out of this conflict. How can we support them? A great thing for DC, especially. So, you know, when I think about like with Haiti, you know, Haiti had a very strong tradition of, of painting. And so, what happened in the earthquake is people started painting the earthquake. And it was a means actually of therapy. And I remember uh, Mrs. Obama and uh, Jill Biden went down to Haiti in a school bus where kids were going to school and painted with the kids. And then we did an exhibit about the, the, uh, that. It was great. It was a great way for, for kids 
as artists to process the trauma of having seen their members of their family and the neighbors killed. But professional artists painted that and that provided a market, a place where they could have a, you know, ha make a living and, and with, with their paintings. Uh, this summer, I'm proud to announce, we will have at the Smithsonian Folklife Festival on the Mall, a concert of Ukrainian musicians, rural and traditional musicians to stars, somebody who's a finalist for Eurovision uh, from Ukraine, but we're doing a concert on the 4th of July. And we'll have Ukrainians singing for their freedom on our Independence Day. So I think artists are very, you know, when you look at what's happening in Ukraine, people use their art as a means of processing experiences, often challenging. And sadly to say, sadly to say, sometimes the best, the best song, the best poetry, the best art comes out of struggle and strife. But the importance of culture is it gives you the strength to be resilient, to come back, and to be creative again. And, you know, I think we were all looking for it. In any of these situations, it's like Arena showed with the Most Star Bridge. That bridge connected communities that were then at war. And to build that bridge was not only building bricks and mortar, it was building community and the social fabric. And I think that's the, hard, that's the thing that's in front of us. It's not just the destruction, but how do we build back after that? That's the challenge. how they can help. So thank you for all the, the work that you're doing, for what you've shared today, but for so much that you are doing to help. Great, thanks. that we get to talk about fashion in Washington. And fashion is arguably the most fundamental dimension of cultural diplomacy. The clothes we wear, the patterns, the textiles from batik to ikat, sarongs, dashikis. Clothes and fashion reflect our identity and is a window into our culture, but recently the lines between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation have been blurred. So to help us understand those nuances and, and what's happening here, I am so honored to be joined by three fashion gurus, starting with Vanessa Friedman. Uh, Vanessa is the fashion director and chief fashion critic of the New York Times. Uh, she's regarded as one of the foremost voices and authorities in the fashion industry. Welcome, Vanessa. Thank you. Next, we have Patricia Michaels. Patricia is from Taos Pueblo, New Mexico. Uh, she is a groundbreaking designer who um, draws her inspiration from her native culture, and she was a runner-up on Project Runway and is hot off the plane from, from Cannes, and I'm, I'm sure you'll talk a little bit more about that. Welcome, Patricia. And then finally, we have Abba Kwawu. Abba is the founder of TAA uh, PR, where she advises the leading fashion brands on strategic communications and brand 
branding. Um, and she started her career as a professor, professor in fashion merchandising at Howard University. So we're so, so fortunate to have Abba with us as well. But I want to dive right in. So Vanessa, help, help us help set the stage. Cultural appropriation can happen in so many elements of culture, whether it's food or, mu um, food or music, but fashion seems to always be at the center of controversy. Why is that? How did we get here? Can you, can you guys hear me? Is this good? Okay. I mean, look, fashion views everything that touches aesthetics as its birthright, right? Like, everything is fair game for the, like, churn of inspiration. And as long as we've had what we think of as fashion, we've had designers borrowing or being inspired or paying homage to other cultures, right? Like you have Poiret and you know what you would have called Orientalism. You had Yves Saint Laurent making a 1967 collection, what they call its African collection. You have John Galliano in 1998 doing the story of Princess Pocahontas at Dior. You know, and for a long time everyone was just like, how you know, how fun. Um, but in the same way that you know we are now able to look back on a lot of things in history and see you know, what was wrong about it. I think increasingly we are seeing this not as appreciation, but as appropriation. And people are, you know, actually seeing it because of social media, able to speak up about it, able to communicate about it. But the system of fashion and how this stuff gets made hasn't really caught up with the reality of the world. And that's where you get the problems. So what's the line? And I'd love just to go kind of starting with Abba and Patricia, what is the line between cultural appreciation and appropriation? Is it, is there, is there a, is it a litmus test or you just know it when you know it? You know, a lot of it is subjective also. Um, and I, I want to preface this by saying that, you know, this is an honest conversation. We all have stepped into territories we didn't mean to. We all have cooked something in our kitchen and thought very proudly about it, and it didn't come from our cultures. Um, Use the song or language, you know, before we've done it. And these are conversations that are alive and spirited in our group chats. So hopefully we can have an honest conversation um, in this room about this. But what I will say is the appropriation comes when someone borrows, steals, smuggles, I will even say, from a culture, they know that it is not theirs. They fetishize it, make it sound and seem like, oh, look at this thing that I found or I created, and oftentimes it's existed, oftentimes for centuries, without giving credit to where that inspiration came from. So there's nothing wrong with borrowing or being inspired by other cultures and other people but it is the not giving credit for claiming it, profiting from it as your own. Appreciation, and my job as a, as a comms professional is often to help our clients tell their stories, articulate that, and often get out of trouble when they get caught in the crosshairs of black Twitter or indigenous TikTok. It's, it's, we are the ones, we are the ones that get sent in to clear, to clear the air. Um, you know, so I think appreciation often is presented as, well, I just was inspired by that. I found that beautiful. And I wanted to bring that inspiration into my collection, but you actually liked it, appreciated it, but didn't give credit. So we can get into the nuances of that. Patricia. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to our country. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my native name is Water Lily. I, I think the fine line is, first of all, we have to acknowledge that Native Americans exist. Throughout our country, the, in North America and in South America, People don't even know that we exist. We have survived every single culture that has come into our beautiful land that we all live in. Once we acknowledge that, we can get to a comfortable place of going to, just starting from the United States, 574 tribes to ask their permission to use imagery that has been inspired for your storyboards, your collections, or your dinner parties. 
I think that when we have different events, a lot of these events inspire investors who are there to understand that Native Americans have now an industry of fashion designers which never existed before. You can go online and Google like National Congress of American Indian and find the different tribal affiliations to understand how to get in contact with Native Americans and just be polite. I'm inspired. What can I do? What can't I do? A lot of these designs have been created by a family member for ceremonial either birth, rites of passage, or death. So what does your company want to represent? What do you want to give to your audience? How do you want to honor your audience? As a designer, whether you be native or non-native, be a real designer. Copy and paste isn't designing. Designing is having integrity in your artistry. And so I think that's where the fine line lends itself. Ta'a, thank you. Can I add one yes. thing? I mean, I think part of the issue is that often when fashion takes, um, takes from other cultures, it takes it as kind of decoration, right? It becomes just an aesthetic choice. And in doing that, you denude it of meaning, you lose all the history and all the narrative that goes behind it. And that, to me, is the, you know, is the kind of line that you know, these, these pieces of inspiration come with their own history and their own story. And if a designer can add that, acknowledge it, mm -hmm. that then is, you know, additive to their story, but by taking it away, you lose all of that, and it's an issue. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about the, the footnote and giving credit, and I'd actually love to hear and, and share examples with the audience of designers who maybe have not done this, and designers who do integrate, like we talked a little bit about Carolina Ferreira and her collection in 2020. And I don't know if you want to share a little bit more with the audience. I mean, to be fair, it wasn't actually her collection. She, she had retired. It was yeah, her West creative director West for this collection. Um, I have a whole cheat sheet, if you want, of, uh, of, of faux pas, you know, going back to, well, starting you know, recently with like 2015 and the Chanel boomerang that you know created a whole brouhaha among Aboriginals in Australia. There was. As you say, Carolina Herrera is the collection in 2019, it was 2018, where um, they were, West was inspired by some, you know, tri indigenous embroideries that he had seen on a trip to Mexico, and he kind of name checked them in these show notes, which of course no one sees except for the few fashion journals who bother to read the show notes, which is not everybody. And and the cultural minister actually protested, you know, wrote a letter to the company. Um, calling them out for this, which was, I think, the first time the government had actually gotten involved. You know, usually, as Ava said, it's, it's Twitter, it's Instagram, it's Diet Prada. Um, you know, it's, it's a very specific echo chamber of kind of fashion, self-proclaimed fashion policemen. Um, <laughs> yeah. Since that was really the first time that it sort of got wider. You know, but it, I mean, it happens again and again and again. There was like five times in, I think, 2019, you know, whether it was Gucci was there, I think called like full indie turban or something yes. that looked a lot like a steep turban. You know, there was Dolce & Gabbana in China. I mean, it just like, it's endless and it's continuing and you, th you think, you're, you're like, seriously, again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think there are some designers mm -hmm. who are learning how to integrate culture uh, respectfully into the collections. And, and Abba, do you want to share some, some examples that you've seen? Of course, and I want to add to that cheat sheet of repeat offenders, um, some of whom we love for, for, for what they bring to the industry, but yes, that Gucci turban, you know, then got popularized by Serial Daddy, you know, uh, Nick Cannon all over television and seeks, that was quite a brouhaha. But, but one that really stood out for me was, uh, I think it was spring 2007, Marc Jacobs put uh, what we call the Ghana Must Go bag on the Louis Vuitton runway as part of his collection. And, and I, I'm a Ghanaian, I was born in Ghana, and my mother was incensed. The group chats went off. Ghana Must Go is on the runway and it's gotten the Vuitton treatment. It's $1,700 now. You know the bag, the plaid, you know, one that rustles and it looks, you know, has the plastic uh, shiny treatment yes. to it. And that's ours, I said. And I would look at mom for bringing her palm oil and nuts back from home in that bag. And I didn't want anyone looking at us in the airport. But suddenly, there it was on the runway at $1,700 plus, and Beyonce had one. And then the fashion critics proclaimed it as clever, 
as elegant as chic, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But then I landed in Hong Kong one year and I saw mountains of this bag. Right. And suddenly it wasn't ours, the Ghanaians anymore. It was theirs. I saw where it came from. But what I saw was there were hundreds of Indonesian migrant workers, the working class, the nannies, the workers were packing these bags full of goodies. This was in December at holiday time to send home to their families. And then that sent me down this rabbit hole, oh, okay, well, if it's not Ghanaian, what is this bag? And only to find that that print belonged to the Indonesian aristocrats originally, designed okay. for ceremonial purposes, right. weddings, birth, and beyond. So when the traders decided to capitalize on it, they made cheap knockoffs uh, of it. So Mark is knocking off the knockoffs. <laughs> and not giving actual credence to where this print came from before slapping the Vuitton mm -hmm. treatment and the expensive price tag on it. You know, so back to what you were saying, working collaboratively with designers of a culture, I think mm -hmm. is very important. Mm -hmm. Very important. So going back to your original question, sorry I'm long-winded. Um, <laughs> there are some assumptions in this argument and I will say that the assumptions are that it's top down, meaning Western, often European white culture, stealing, smuggling bits and pieces from other indigenous mm -hmm. cultures. It's a neo-colonialism in a way, mm -hmm. honestly, if you look at it. Mm -hmm. But what I'm seeing in the best practices are designers like Stella Jean, who is a Haitian Italian designer, or Debe Magugu out of South Africa, um, these are people who have a distinct voice and point of view to the point that the likes of Dior, the likes of Adidas and global conglomerates want to partner with them to bring that aesthetic, that history, that culture into their collections. And so what I want to say is a brand like Duaba Sewa, who is a Ghanaian, who was inspired by Japanese origami, she went to Japan. And she sat with those people, and she was taught by them how to create triangles and origami, and she brought that into her collections. And she gives and pays homage to the history of Japanese origami that actually was brought by Chinese monks to Japan, and they created something together. So there are people who are doing this correctly. In the case of Tebe, he brings his South African, he's from Kimberley, heritage into everything he does. Mm -hmm. So when Dior came to him and said, let's do a collection that's only going to be available in our flagships, it was unmistakably South African. When he did a collaboration with Valentino, they sent a couture, gorgeous gown to him to repurpose, but also did a cultural exchange where he got to send a lime-colored pantsuit to Pierpaolo at Valentino to also repurpose. But what happened in that moment was they were doing something together born out of a respect, an actual love of their culture. They found common ground. And what came out of that was actually a new moment, a new conversation. It's about collaboration, and I love that. Wow. So Patricia, how advice to designers who are trying to incorporate different elements of a culture that they're not a part of into the, their designs. How can designers respectfully include um, inspiration from different cultures? I'm sure you see it a lot in native, non-native designers incorporating native mm -hmm. elements into their clothing. So, so once again, um, by doing collaborations with other natives from your storyboard and your theme is really important. When you get that conversation, you're delving deeper into some insight that you didn't really quite understand in the first place. That, as a creative team, is going to make a beautiful design collection that's going to mean something that's not going to be stereotypical. Because if you look at Native American history, we didn't, it's famous for its beadwork, because they took the bead which originated, the glass bead originated from Africa. And then, of course, then Czechoslovakia and Murano beads came to trade with Native Americans. The way Native Americans use ribbon from Lyon, all of that evolved and it translated into our own representation of ceremonial regalia. And our regalia isn't something that needs to be stereotyped. 
So that's why it's really important to speak with the natives. We're, we're here, we're available. There's so many people, you can find them at Santa Fe Indian Market, and you can just Google you know, Native American fashion designers online. It, now, there's no excuse to pretend like the information isn't available. In the simplest forms, it is available. We are here. And I think by, by choosing to have that conversation and start it, then you're going to get a really intellectual, beautiful collection. And you want to honor your client. Our world is far more sophisticated and appreciative of how far we have come. And to, to be here today and have this, this really small little conversation that's starting is important. So now we just have to start doing the work. Okay. I think um, you know, one of the things we, we're sort of assuming that some of this is conscious, that there's an awareness of where designers are actually getting their inspiration or their, um, their ideas. And in fact, I think a lot of it now is, is unconscious because so much of research happens online, right? So much of it is people just like tapping into, you know, typing into Google, like, you know, flower embroidery or something. And they see a million images and right. they'll maybe screenshot one. You know, someone on the design team will screenshot one and it'll get put on a mood board or put in a folder and then it'll get mixed up with something else and something else. And then it gets finally put on a product and no one really knows where it came from. And I think part of this is like a systemic failure of understanding like the need to really research where your imagery and your ideas are coming from. And then you get to the point where you can actually approach the people who in fact invented this right. and are responsible for it. Oh, you know what I wanted to add to that is I think that the institutions, college, universities of design, they need to have a course on Native American fashion for one thing, where one of the oldest um, looks that are on the runway, you know, I don't see any pilgrim looks on the runway, just saying. <laughs> so that would really help. <laughs> I'm trying to apply for Parsons to get a job there <laughs> on that, so, yeah, I mean, I do some little small lectures for all universities, and, and I try to educate and help them through this in a gentle, respectful manner, because at the end of the day, we all come from a beautiful place on this earth. There isn't a place that isn't magic, and that's why a Native American prayer, a prayer is for all living life and matter, so in respects to everybody interested. You know, I wanted to just quickly add, if I may, Vanessa, you make a really important point that a lot of it is unintentional. Um, thanks to social media, the internet, all of the things that are happening now, many things that belong to a people have now been elevated to pop culture. And pop culture absolutely has a role in what we're seeing now and what we're judging as appreciation or appropriation because does it truly belong to a people? things get taken out of context, as you mentioned, and into the realm of pop culture, and then people start to pilfer, borrow, however they do it. And I think that's a larger conversation that you know, yeah, we should I have. I want to go to that point of ownership of yeah. culture, who owns culture. Yeah. But first, Vanessa, talk to us a little bit about some of the larger design houses. Do you see any of this backlash like, do they take this backlash into account? Is it, are we in danger of stifling creativity and inspiration? And or, have you seen fashion houses be proactive? Do they have like a chief cultural officer who they, they make, they're, they're getting ahead of this. Take us inside kind of the inner, the inner working. I don't feel like I'm like no more about the inner workings of some of these houses than I do. But I can't <laughs> say. I'll have to kill you all if I tell you. I don't know, but when I call them, they're like, oh, God, go away. <laughs> um, do they have one? I think they have people they work with. They may have people inside. But the problem is they're, they're enormous, right, and, and global. And often the people who are on the ground who really are on the kind of front line of 
you know, wow, this product is not going to float well in this market. They are so downstream from the actual production that by the time they see it, it's way too late. And even if they could get the message back to headquarters, which they probably can't because this, these are very top-down organizations. So I think they're aware of the problem. I do not think they've figured out how to deal with it. And so they're constantly playing catch-up, right? They're constantly apologizing. And now they have the apology thing down to a, a pretty yeah. sort, of, sort of science. It's a and performance. They, like, they can like wait oh, this, no. like, this long and then like yeah. come back and it'll be okay. <laughs> You know, but ideally we get to a wow. point where they can actually change the system enough so that we can stop trying to fix the problem after it has happened mm. and fix it before. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's exhausting to us comms people. Right? <laughs> um, but yeah. I think some of that solution, and you hit the nail on the head, is having the people at the table and high up enough to catch some of those things. Because some of those things do originate and they're innocent. Honestly, you know, but if someone's not at the table, and we deal with this often, my team is in this room, we know the kind of calls we have where, you know, not just fashion, they, they put an image out there and they get attacked and they bring it back to us and said, and I'm like, I saw it. Don't you see that? Yeah. You know, but they, they don't because that's not their lived experience. So if you don't have people at the table who can help advise and keep you out of trouble, it's the constant apology cycle. Directors and hearing them, or the CEOs yep. and hearring them, that's it. Doesn't matter. So you don't okay. see any danger of stifling creativity, like designers I staying away. I do. I, I know that it's extremely difficult as a designer to be able to come upon an image that you know is a part of your language from your village, but it might mean something different to another village. And so out of respect for something as simple as an arrowhead or an eagle feather, you know, how can you use it without hurting people? And so you have to, at that point, you really just, when I create, you have to say, okay, I never asked to be the design police, but I know I'm using it in the best of my culture to only help other people as, as, as wearing something that isn't taboo. So I think as a designer, as long as you're giving something that isn't taboo, but my God, media, the, the world, stop also attacking creative people to the point where we're just gonna be wearing white and black clothing. I mean, it's <laughs> like, it becomes overwhelming sometimes. And, and so, um, you know, I, I, we, we do live in a world where we, we share one another's culture and we celebrate one another's culture, and respectfully, I mean, I'm using silk, so am I appropriating Asia, you know? I use silk because I wanted to break away from the stereotype of what Native American fashion is about. I use synthetic um, digital printing because it's more eco-friendly. There's a responsibility that is towards, you know, as a contemporary Native, that we continue, and, and I think that is with every culture, I think storylines are important. Incorporating people who are part of your your storyboard is, you know, a constant, constant. And um, like, don't police us to the end of nobody wants to wear our stuff anymore. Because then people are like, well, if I wear this, am I appropriating Native America? And I don't think that's healthy then for us designers, especially on a native scale. We're so small. We don't have a big team. We hire a team at the last minute. I just came back from the Cannes Film Festival. I hired a team of eight people. I had to take a loan out to do it. And my piece had eagle feathers all hand painted on the gown. Then it became a question. Oh, she's the only one on the native team that used the native theme. Is she being too native? While the rest of my life, my booths and my art artistry was protested that I wasn't native enough because this isn't a native design I'm wearing. <laughs> yeah. This is part yeah. of this kind of current cultural, you know, another part of this cultural moment we're in now, which is like a lot of very angry, yes. very aggressive people, particularly expressing themselves that way online, right? Like social media is such a font of like fury yes. and, yeah. and sort of automatically defaulting to, you know, thinking the worst possible thing. Yeah. And it is a problem when, you know, people are endlessly being attacked or accused of 
you know, of stealing, of plagiarism, whatever, as opposed to educate it. And there is a way to talk about these issues that is more productive and probably would do more to get everyone to the table, as both of you have said, you know, whereas when you just go after someone, you know, the kind of default reaction is almost always a defensive approach. Absolutely. I wanted to share just a quick quote that um, Thebe, the designer I was speaking about in South Africa, sent me just this morning. And he said his thoughts on the idea of appropriation versus appreciation is it's a, education is always the critical thing. If you're going to appreciate something, give it room to tell its own stories using creators or crafters from that culture to curate the story. You know, when you remove this, you're imposing yourself onto culture, and that's when it becomes appropriation. Education is deep research, which can only come from the originators. And when you strip this from the project, it's purely ego. And it's a look at what I found, a colonizer approach. Talk about that. We've mm -hmm. talked a lot about the design side, mm -hmm. but let's talk about the consumer side. And there's been a lot of controversy around people, whether they're celebrities, they're officials, who are wearing um, different designs that are not of their culture. What What is your advice to us? I, I love a good caftan in the summer. Like, is, but how should I wear that? Like, how should we be thinking about clothing in, in, in this cultural context? Well, like I've said, if you're the design house, how do you want to respect your consumer? Who is your client? What do you want to give them to wear? Be conscious that whatever you're providing for, a, for the world to buy is your responsibility. And I love all diversity. If I want to wear some, a silk kimono print and, and, and I'm loving that, am I wrong? You know, should I blame the person who sold it to me? Maybe not. But at the same time, if you buy from Native American, Native American products, more than likely, you're going to be buying something safe that isn't taboo to be wearing. But if you're buying Native American from another company that has no affiliation or didn't do a collaboration, more than likely it's taboo. So I think that's where the consumer can then be responsible. And then if they're going to be buying from mass production that's throwaway fashion, then that consumer is responsible for buying that kind of fashion. And usually that's the one that's taboo. Can you give it some of your readers' advice on, on this? And I think a lot of it is education. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of talk about traceability in fashion in terms of production, in terms of materials, factories, um, manufacturing. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about, it. like, can we make a QR code that if you scan it, it'll tell you, like, what fabrics this is made, you know, is it sustainable? Who are the people who are involved? And I don't see why we shouldn't be able to do the same thing with the kind of history of a garment, you know, the actual like narrative of a garment. Like this is the culture it came from. These are the people who are involved. Because like clothes don't come with explanations. And that's another part of the issue, right? Like when you buy something, there's not a long tag. And if there was, you probably wouldn't read it anyway. Yeah. That like, you know, explained the, or the source material yes. of the actual ideas that went into the design. You know, but if there was some sort of, you know, thing you could scan and read it on your phone at your leisure, it might actually be possible. And that would go, you know, a long way, not just to educating the people who are actually making it, but the people who are buying it and wearing it and, you know, be additive for all of us. Like, I would love that. But sometimes you just want a really pretty dress. Yeah. 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 No. To be honest, like, sometimes you don't want to read a dissertation on the evolution of the, the indigo dye. I just really like that thing and I want to buy it. I don't even care who made it. Let's, I mean, if we may really be right. honest. And going back to, again, Red Meridian and the role of government and institutions to help with some of that regulation, maybe at the very top, might save me 
way down here when I go to the store from getting into some yeah, of this Yeah, well, trouble. let's talk about that. It goes back to the ownership of culture. You know, we have mm. protected designations of origin for food, for champagne, for cheese. Like, is that something that governments need to do for textiles, for handicrafts? Like, would that help? Have you seen any of this? Um, and is that, should that be our next new initiative at Meridian? I love that idea. I, I mean, absolutely respect given because when, when you, I go back to the first thing I say, when you think about the 575 tribes in the United States and people not knowing that we're alive, the reason I went into fashion was because it was the most shallow consumer driven artistry that I knew of. And I thought if I could get a shallow consumer to stop and listen to me, then I'm successful as an artist. So if that little QR code was on there, then for those people who care, that would be a nice segue of our message being conveyed. I mean, you know, I, I think like it's a nice idea, but I actually am not sure those protections or those sort of di distinctions make a huge difference. I mean, like we call couture couture, but then like every other designer I know makes couture garments, they call it custom made or made for you, whatever. It is the same thing, right? Prosecco exists, cava exists, people That's now right. love it. Right. Right. You know, I mean, so like nice for champagne, but meh. Yeah. Well, I want to make sure that we get to uh, questions um, from the audience. So I think we're going to pivot right now. If anyone has a question, please, uh, we'll have microphones coming around. Yes. Hi, my name is Laura. Yeah. Hi, my name is Laura Nix. Um, I, I work at the Embassy of Australia in the cultural program. Um, so, in the arts, and I know you guys have touched, kind of touched on this when you're talking about giving credit and collaboration. Um, but what I find through my work, and I hope you can um, kind of talk about this a little bit more, is that that really all goes back to IP, uh, intellectual property. Um, and, and what stands behind that credit is actually a form of payment um, and, and not just the words. So I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit more about what credit and collaboration actually entails because I think that that's often what's overlooked and it's not just a caption on an image or a, a, you know, a attribution on a, on a photograph or something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Just in preparation for the panel, I asked myself the question of, about ownership and about what's next in this conversation, because we've talked about cultural appropriation for a very long time now, now appreciation. What's next for me, I think, is equity. And that's what you're getting at. I think with the designers going around the world now with their resort collections to Mumbai and Mexico and Korea, it's all exotic and beautiful and fun. But what are those indigenous artisans and artists and collaborators? Do they now have a seat at the table once you've moved on to the next erogenous zone, to the next culture, to the next trend? What is it for them? And I think equity, sharing in the profits, um, sharing in the world stage, having access now to resources that maybe, or technology maybe, that is not readily available to them, I think is the next point. So when a client says, well, I didn't mean to do that, it's about appreciation, my next question is, okay, so what are we really doing? Who's at the table? Where do we go from here? Yeah, and I think that um, with that, as long as you're giving a job to another designer to be part of your collaboration, and if it's something that is like Navajo beautiful rugs, give to the Navajo elderly who are the ancestors who created those beautiful blankets. Actually, I have a question, just a follow-up question about that for both of you, because I feel like designers now are doing more of that. I mean, certainly, like, we talked about the cruise collections. I mean, every time Maria Grazia Churia Dior goes into a different culture, she brings in artisans, and she puts them in her front row, and they pay them for their yeah. work, for their embroidery. Yeah. Right. But then I think it ends. So the question is like, how do you then, okay, I mean, she's elevating them yeah. and she's saying to the world, I think that these craftspeople are, you know, exactly the same as my petit man, that they deserve the same recognition. 
but like how do you keep that going? I think that if the infrastructure was available for Native American designers to be competitive in the design world so that we have quality textiles, prints, uh, construction, manufacturing, then we can be part of our own industry and language. But right now, we don't have that infrastructure. So that would help. I think asking the people what they need. Ask them what it is that would help preserve uh, further you know, the culture. Whatever it is that they need is the opportunity for brands. And I, I will say, I did observe one major Italian brand that did some of that. They make a lot of mistakes, but they do did they did some things really right in appointing a, a, a person who was a head of culture. And I was in the room when they asked the cultures that they were borrowing and collaborating with, well, what do you need? Even at the educational level, is it sewing machines? Do you need access to fabric? Do you want our people to come in and teach technique? And they did that. They put their money there, but they put their resources and their brain talent and everything that they have learned mm -hmm. there. So then it continues and it builds up the next generation. It builds up those industries. Um, so I think that is the opportunity. And you're absolutely right. Right now it feels like it's genuine. I've gone to Mexico. I've partnered with uh, Mexican artisans, activists even. The collection is a success critically, maybe um, commercially it will be a success. What are they receiving? And not just for this season, are they now going to have a job at the atelier? Yeah. Probably not. But you know, that's the question of what's next in this appreciation conversation. Yeah. Equity. Hi, I'm oops, sorry. <laughs> I'm Shelley Langdale. I'm a curator at the National Gallery of Art. Um, and thank you for your really interesting conversation. I have sort of two questions. You touched on, you know, the certain large organizations in the fashion industry are getting really good at apologizing. Is there, or is, is there any evidence, um, maybe not down to the label on the individual outfit, but that there's any motivation in providing more information about their company? I know. The only one I can think of off the top of my head was like Zuri has been, become really popular for, you know, sort of very on their website, really including a lot of detail about where their fabrics are coming from, where their designs are coming from, things like that as part of their advertising. Is that something that you're starting to see? And my second question is, is there any model, because I, forgive me, I don't know a lot of details, and this is why I was so interested in your talk today about your industry, but is there anything equivalent to like Jose Garza's World Central Kitchen that's unifying, you know, that unifies restaurateurs, um, that is unifying designers or, you know, manufacturers to work in, you know, sort of come together and help communities and sort of solve some of these issues or address them anyway? Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know of any. <laughs> I'll go back to your first question, um, which is after the apology. Is that was that? If I yeah. get this right, yeah. after the the performance of the apology, now I think it's it's be really their their cues now. You know how to do it. There's a formula. Then what? Um, may I bring up the case study, and it may not be a perfect case study of Gucci and Dapper Dan, where. Dapper Dan is known in the 80s in Harlem for screen printing and making, taking Gucci and Vuitton and MCM, you know, luxury brand icon, iconography, and creating his own designs for his clientele um, and, and getting really famous, at least, and hood rich, if you will, from it, right? He was sued by these brands, shut down his atelier, and you didn't hear about him for quite a while, until one of his designs showed up on a Gucci runway. Mm -hmm. And thanks to social media, that echo chamber that it is, people were incensed. So you sued him and shut him down for appropriating, if you will, and then you used one of his designs and did not give credit. Well, what they did was to go to him and create a partnership something that feels equitable in a sense. 
So giving him fabrics, opening up a, a, an appointment only atelier in Harlem, um, which is similar to his original atelier, and letting him do what he does, take the Gucci brand and create something that they could never do. Um, and it put him on a world stage. He said he had no access to the real fashion global world until that collaboration happened, but he's smart enough to say this is about commerce. He has been quoted as saying that. They get something, I get something um, from this. So that's one case study that is not without its flaws, I will say, but they said sorry, but didn't just move on. They did something with a designer like this. That's just one example. They sucked him up. They did. <laughs> okay. which, which is, I mean, to be fair, what fashion, what these big brands do. I mean, they, you know, they are really expert. And, you know, I'm not, like, this isn't necessarily a criticism, but they are really expert at taking the thing that is threatening to them and bringing it into the fold. And exploiting sometimes, but he's a smart one. <laughs> <laughs> One more question, Tara. Let's see if I can talk about it. Right. Uh, Tara Engel, Pernod Ricard. Uh, so, Global Wine and Spirits Company. Um, thank you so much, Natalie, for having us. Uh, this has been just incredible, and uh, a lot of what you've said has resonated, especially the, uh, the part about people not listening when you give advice. Um, so, so, one comment, I think the one of the messages that I'm hearing is we do all need to learn to give each other a little grace as we manage through this. Um, and, and how do we really teach each other too to do real research again? Because I think that's a skill that a lot of people lack. So my question is in the fashion arena and just generally, how do we start implementing that in schools? Should, should fashion schools start requiring deeper research courses so that designers actually know how to do that? Because I think they lack that skill set. And so if they're not equipped, yeah. how are they going to be able to, to really actually go do that? I actually asked that question to, to a bunch of fashion schools recently because of a, a problem with um, where actually a brand was accused of stealing an artist, actually, an artist's work. Um, and I asked them if they were teaching their graduates to footnote. Because footnoting is, to me, like the answer to all this. I mean, like, <laughs> like, we have to do it, right? Like, as a journalist, I have to credit my sources. I don't think crediting my sources in any way takes away from my final product. Right. And I just think, like, fashion needs to learn to credit its sources. It needs to footnote. It's not that hard. Needs to footnote, needs to go back to the traditional sense of research is what I'm hearing. But the world has changed so much. I remember being in graduate school, sitting in the basement of a you know library, looking through journals and encyclopedias. And God forbid my teenage children have to do that today. They're talking to the chat bot. The chat bot. Yeah. It's the AI who's not going to tell them, you know, where that glass bead came from. You know, so we do have a real issue because, because the way that we learn, the way that we consume has changed so much. So the idea, and, and having taught university level, I did that at, at Howard University, I taught the, you know, history of fashion course. Yes, I did, but we taught it from a historical standpoint. Now, and it's been a while since I, I've been, I've had a professor hat on, but I would hope that mm -hmm. even in the elementary school levels, yeah. high school, college levels, we're being taught respect, mm -hmm. number one, and to ask questions. And I don't know that they ask questions anymore. Not the way we used to. My kid's talking to the Snapchat chat bot. It's scary. I was gonna say, talking about like, Chatbot. I actually, like, if you ask the chatbot, not Bard, but the chatbot, like, to do research for you, um, like, get me all the stories about fashion appropriation, for example, it will give you back, like, 10 different citations, all of them made up. Oh. See, see, and I think what's important in schools, starting from kindergarten through high school, is your field trips of cultural field trips so that they get a little sense of culture just in the neighborhood 
because most neighborhoods have a beautiful variety of different cultures. So start your children off young. That's the most honest thing. And usually for Native Americans where you know it's gonna be true are people who are with nature. Because Na Native Americans across the one commonality that we all share as far as our culture is the appreciation for everything living. And so once you have that, you, you can't go wrong. But also please go to different events. There's beautiful, I can't say it enough, where the most artistic representation for Native Americans um, for North America is at Swaya Santa Fe Indian Market, third week of August, religiously. And when you go there, be prepared. Everything that is made in that plaza is made with a prayer from all types of Native American communities. So it's a beautiful, sacred place, but it's also people selling to you what isn't taboo. And you get to learn them. You get to talk to the originators. And then most powwows, most Native American powwows, have people of their original origin there. And you can talk to them, ask them if they have time, if they want to talk at all. I mean, powwows, are maybe some people are just there to dance and they don't want to talk to you, they just want to dance. But, you know, we're all human at the end of the day. It starts with the conversation, you know, respect one another's space, the land that you walk on. And, you know, I appreciate every bit of time and amazing. knowledge. This Thank you. This has been an amazing conversation. I hope everyone learned a little bit. <laughs> conversations in Washington soon. Thank you, everyone. My name is Risky Rahmad, and I am a creative, and I am a mover. I work in data science and economics. I help you know, policymakers translate data into insights. And so I'm always looking at large data sets and trying to make sense of the spontaneous order that is. I've served in some cultural arts envoys to the State Department, programming with the next level staff. As an artist, as a dancer, and as a mover, I feel like there's a certain flow to it. When I'm looking for trends and outliers and analyzing data, it's very much the same way of when I'm freestyling and, and interpreting a song. Art should be functional, and the best art is functional. And applying it in the, the context of cultural diplomacy, it's using art not only as a platform, but as a medium of exchange to you know, foster functional relationships. So to me, um, beautiful art is art that can be used and art that can connect people together. My name is Gustavo Rihuela, and I'm from Bolivia. I am a violinist, musician, and cultural manager. I don't speak English very well, but I do speak music. I believe that music is a language that is heard and understood from emotions and is deeper than words. That inspires me a lot. Because music is not only beautiful as art, it can also generate dialogues, transform people and societies. There are several sources that inspired me to create. Life itself, the people I love the most, 
my little daughter Victoria. And my daily work begins and ends with my violin. Because from my violin, his name is Sotelo, I connect with everything. With my family, with my friends, with the public. My experience with Merida was fantastic. I was able to learn great experience of the work carried out by people and organizations generating social change through the arts. My name is Michelle Angela Ortiz and I am a visual artist, community arts educator, and filmmaker. I was able to connect with Meridian by leading uh, two cultural diplomacy programs that we did in Honduras in 2015 and in Cuba in 2016. Uh, we were able to create a, a beautiful mural in La Colonia Febrero, 21 de Febrero, in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. One of the things that I share with people as I've done work um, through Meridian and as a cultural envoy since 2008, a great opportunity for me is to travel, to be able to share my work with other artists, but also to represent a different perspective of America. When you see someone like myself as a child of immigrants, as a woman of color, as someone that really has had a different type of experience here in the United States. There are similarities in our struggles. And I feel that um, just challenging the concept of, of that the United States has all the answers. Um, I think it's more powerful to speak to what are the challenges that we face? What is the work that we're still trying to do together? And what's really important, especially within these projects through cultural diplomacy, is to showcase how arts and culture can be a tool for change. My name is Risky Rahmad, and I am a creative and I am a mover. I work in data science and economics. I help you know, policymakers translate data into insights. And so I'm always looking at large data sets and trying to make sense of the spontaneous order that is. I've served in some cultural arts envoys to the State Department, programming with the Next Level staff. As an artist, as a dancer, and as a mover, I feel like there's a certain flow to it. When I'm looking for trends and outliers and analyzing data, it's very much the same way of when I'm freestyling and, and interpreting a song. Art should be functional, and the best art is functional. And applying it in the, the context of cultural diplomacy, it's using art not only as a platform, but as a medium of exchange to you know, foster functional relationships. So to me, um, beautiful art is art that can be used and art that can connect people together.
Hi everybody, my name is Gustavo Arihuela and I'm from Bolivia. I am a violinist, musician and cultural manager. I don't speak English very well, but I do speak music. I believe that music is a language that is heard and understood from emotions and is deeper than words. That inspires me a lot because music is not only beautiful as art, it can also generate dialogues, transform people and societies. There are several sources that inspire me to create. Life itself, the people I love the most, my living daughter Victoria. And my daily work begins and ends with my violin, because from my violin, his name is Sotelo, I connect with everything, with my family, with my friends, with the public. My experience with Eurydion was fantastic. I was able to learn great experience of the work carried out by people and organizations generating social change through the arts. My name is Michelle Angela Ortiz and I am a visual artist, community arts educator, and filmmaker. I was able to connect with Meridian by leading uh, two cultural diplomacy programs that we did in Honduras in 2015 and in Cuba in 2016. Uh, we were able to create a, a beautiful mural in La Colonia Febrero, 21 de Febrero, in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. One of the things that I share with people as I've done work um, through Meridian and as a cultural envoy since 2008, a great opportunity for me is to travel, to be able to share my work with other artists, but also to represent a different perspective of America. When you see someone like myself as a child of immigrants, as a woman of color, as someone that really has had a different type of experience here in the United States, there are similarities in our struggles. And I feel that um, just challenging the concept of, of that the United States has all the answers, um, I think it's more powerful to speak to what are the challenges that we face? What is the work that we're still trying to do together? And what's really important, especially within these projects through cultural diplomacy, is to showcase how arts and culture can be a tool for change. My name is Risky Rahman, and I am a creative and I am a mover. I work in data science and economics. I help you know, policymakers translate data into insights. And so I'm always looking at large data sets and trying to make sense of the spontaneous order that is. I've served in some cultural arts envoys to the State Department, programming with the Next Level staff. As an artist, as a dancer, and as a mover, 
I feel like there's a certain flow to it. When I'm looking for trends and outliers and analyzing data, it's very much the same way of when I'm freestyling and, and interpreting a song. Art should be functional, and the best art is functional. And applying it in the, the context of cultural diplomacy, it's using art not only as a platform, but as a medium of exchange to you know, foster functional relationships. So to me, um, beautiful art is art that can be used and art that can connect people together. Hi everybody, my name is Gustavo Orihuela and I'm from Bolivia. I am a violinist, musician and cultural manager. I don't speak English very well, but I do speak music. I believe that music is a language that is heard and understood from emotions and is deeper than words. That inspires me a lot. Because music is not only beautiful as art, it can also generate dialogues, transform people and societies. There are several sources that inspire me to create. Life itself, the people I love the most, my living daughter Victoria. And my daily work begins and ends with my violin. Because for my violin, his name is Sotelo, I connect with everything, with my family, with my friends, with the public. My experience with Meridian was fantastic. I was able to learn great experience of the work carried out by people and organizations generating social change through the arts. <laughs> That's what Nor always says. He says, no matter what you're doing, just smile. Smile.
Okay. Thank you, thank you. I hope the break was refreshing. Got some coffee in you, stretched the legs a little bit. I'm really excited about this next panel. Um, introduce myself, I'm TK Harvey. I'm the Vice President for Cultural Programs at the Meridian Center for Cultural Diplomacy. Mouthful, sorry. Um, but this is where we bring cultures together. Uh, this is only a small example of the great programs that we do with leadership exchange programs, artist residency uh, exchanges, exhibitions all around the world. Um, look forward to sharing with you more if we get a chance to speak offline, but to get started here, it is my honor uh, and privilege to introduce the third panel of the day, Art for Inclusion and Identity. Uh, the conversation will be led by and moderated by gallerist Marian Boski, who established her gallery in New York in 1996. Since its inception, the gallery has come to represent and support the work of emerging and established contemporary artists of all media and genres. Marianne has since opened a second location in New York and one in Aspen, in addition to organizing temporary exhibitions internationally to extend her commitment to supporting the needs and interests of the gallery's dynamic roster of artists from around the world. Our four speakers are Marilyn Mentor, Claudia Gould, Talisa Fleming, and Dr. Jonathan Katz. Marilyn, who requires very little introduction, uh, is an American artist currently living and working in New York City whose work has been the subject of numerous solo exhibitions and has been included in group exhibitions internationally. As the New York Times writes, her art has helped spur frank discussions of gender, identity, sexuality, diversity, and reproductive rights. Marilyn's art is currently on display at the New York Gallery LGDR until June 3rd, just tomorrow. Claudia Gould is the director of the Jewish Museum in New York City. During her 12-year tenure as director, Claudia shifted the museum's primarily focused historical focus uh, into a dynamic contemporary art program. Notable exhibitions she has overseen include a 2017 Florine Stettheimer survey and a 2019 show inspired by musician Leonard Cohen. Before joining the Jewish Museum, Claudia was the director of the Institute of Contemporary Art Philadelphia, Artist Space in New York City, and curator at Wexner Center for the Arts and MoMA PS1. Talisa Fleming is the interim chief curator of visual arts at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. She has played a critical role in building the museum's collection and was the lead curator for Reckoning, Protest, Defiance, Resilience, and the inaugural exhibition, Visual Art and the American Experience, in addition to co-curating several other exhibitions. Dr. Jonathan Katz is widely considered the founding figure in queer art history. Covering the late 19th century to the present, Jonathan has written extensively about gender, sexuality, and desire, producing some of the key theoretical work in queer studies in the visual arts. In 2010, he curated the first major museum exhibition of its kind in the US, Hide Seek, Difference and Desire in American Portraiture at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, which sparked an international conversation on censorship and inclusion. You could say it, putting it lightly, right? <laughs> Welcome all, and now to you, Marion. bit intimidating with this incredible group of panelists here. Um, but I've, I've prepared and I'm trying to sort of limit the topics because this is a huge minefield in a way. Um, and I think one that's incredibly, you know, positive moving. So there's a lot um, to talk about. And um, we're going to discuss identity politics um, and what is now, I think, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So uh, it's evolved, and um, we're gonna talk about the role of artists um, and what uh, role they play in shaping our understanding of inclusion and identity, and also what the role of institutions have in, um, have played in the past of marginalizing non-dominant voices, and how they're taking action to implement change. Um, so I have questions for this group that, in, that involve, you know, where do, where do they see the line between vigilant efforts towards change and virtue signaling. Um, and questions about museums and institutions, if they're meant to be our storehouses of history and curators are tasked with framing these narratives, how can artists and institutions create space to change what has been a primarily white male narrative? And how are artists and museums addressing the huge gaps to be filled in a responsible way? Um, another question to discuss is <laughs> private funding for institutions. How can they be trusted? How can the to tell the stories, <clears throat> sorry, um, truthfully. And uh, our panelists are some of the best 
thought leaders shaping a more representative and inclusive art world. So um, the question about whether the power is really shifting, um, I wanted to start with Marilyn. Uh, as a pioneering feminist artist, how is your experience as a female artist different today than when you started in the art world? And how has your activism and advocacy for women's liberties hurt or helped your career? That's loaded. <laughs> oh, I All of it is. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll just a few, I'm, I'm old as dirt. So <laughs> when I went to school in the 70s at Syracuse University, I'd not, never left the South before. I taught black leaders. I was the only woman, and there were 17 guys. And the guys were, um, half of them were there to get out of the Vietnam War. And so um, there, they, they called shows one-man shows. The one-woman shows did not exist. And uh, the, what, the word wasn't even out there. I remember when I said I'm having a one-woman show. I said, that's not what you call it. You know, it was that different than it is now. I mean, it's so shocking. Um, I think I, I thought to myself, I never had a woman teacher, not anywhere in undergraduate, not anywhere in graduate school. But I was the teacher. I was teaching freshman drawing, and that's how I, that's how I paid my tuition. And it was uh, another world. It was not anything like it. We have made such progress in this area. But I, I, where I saw, I only studied two women artists. I think that Beverly Pepper and Mary Cassatt in art school, in art school. But I had art magazines. And I saw Marisol, and I saw, jo saw Joan Mitchell in the magazines. And, uh, but I also realized, like, I think even uh, somebody like uh, Helen uh, Frankenthaler, she was the, uh, the American Pavilion. And, uh, and she was that important. She was the artist of the American Pavilion in the Venice Biennale. And she was just erased, you know, in art history. I mean, nobody paid any attention to her. And Joan Mitchell was one of the best artists I've ever seen. And she was erased. Or somebody like uh, Alice Neal. I didn't even know anything about Alice Neal other than she did these weird little portraits. And so it was like, in the art magazines, that's where the real change was. All these art, you know, um, there were minimalist art, women artists. And I saw them there and that said, OK, this is a change. This is what, what, what's happening. I don't know what I thought I was. But I didn't think I would. I didn't think of myself as female. I thought of myself as just an artist. I didn't have those. But I was a, a major. Um, I was always uh, a, a supporter of Planned Parenthood. And so this was right at the time when um, Roe, versus, Roe v. Wade was passed, and it was like a whole new world. And the next year they had three. They had two. Uh, there were three of us. I was second year. There were two women. Two young girls also accepted in the in the grad school. But it's now, I teach at grad school now, and ha half of my students, more than half maybe, are women. And half the teachers are women. And uh, I, mean, I wanted to show you the change is, I w I've been watching, because I've, you know, I've been marginalized for most of my career, which is not a terrible place, I want to say, um, in the sense that, I guess I should fill that out. Because if, you're, if you get enough, you're going to be fine. You know, and I always taught, so I always uh, had a job, and I did commercial work, and um, I got to do whatever I wanted. And I saw all these, you know, and they were always white male stars in the white heat. And the white heat meaning, you know, they became uh, popular to the popular culture. And I saw how um, they were really young and hot, and I saw a lot of them burn out and just make parodies for what they were known for. And very few of them, took risks anymore. And I saw, well, all these, and I read art history all the time, and I read um, uh, biographies, and I saw there were so many artists that were so ahead of their time, but uh, they didn't get any attention till they're late. You know, someone like Gustin, and now we could see Alice Neal, and I mean, I just saw, I'm jo I know I'm jumping all over the place, but I'm gonna give you these names. I mean, I just saw, Singa Nagrudi, is that how you say her name? Yeah. I mean, she blew the back of my head off. That's mm -hmm. a whole new language. Mm -hmm. How did I not know about this artist? You know, I barely knew the name because of just about Midtown, because I was in shows there in the 80s. But it's like the culture, um, if you're not, if you weren't a bad boy, white boy artist, you, were, you didn't exist. You were constantly marginalized. But at the same time, you get to do whatever you want. 
you know you get like if you have uh, uh, if you if you're making a million dollars for every drawing you do how, how no one telling you you're terrible yeah, you know, it sounds to me like you're making um, lemonade out of lemons a bit. <laughs> um, it's, I know it sucks, but it's also, I think of people like Alice Neal, and uh, they <clears throat> took these chances. They yeah. had fun. And we ha there has been a lot of progress. I think the, the question now becomes, you know, as we've made this progress and we've had a recognition of, you know, women painters, women artists, um, and now we've moved into, you know, artists of color. Um, we've had shows that are focused on queer art. When we were um, looking at an, the idea of, of neutralizing, making everything equal and, and available, we've now come to this shift in identity labeling. And so, Talisa, I wanted to ask you, um, in your role at the museum, um, I've read about some of your thoughts, and maybe you can share them on the, the, the labeling of African-American artist versus artist, mm -hmm. which also applies to female artist versus artist. And your experience with the museum and curating, are the artists that are being invited to show desirous of being in all black shows, all women shows? All, because there's positives and negatives to those approaches. Okay, to talk about sort of the identity of the artist. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do when we created this exhibition is honor how they, how they perceive themselves and how they want to present themselves to the world. And in my research going back to the 18th century, you find that artists, African-American artists, just want to be called artists. You do have artists like Afro-Cobra, who consider themselves black artists, but um, most of the artists that I've come across really want to be American artists or artists in general, right? So um, when I started my career, I started as an American generalist, and I did art from colonial America to the present, and it was an American art department. I'm an American, African Americans have been here um, since the very beginning and helped build this country and are central to how we understand ourselves, our rights, who we are. And um, it's interesting moving from that American art gallery, which I felt very strongly about only calling African American artists artists in the show, to doing an all black show, which I told myself I would never do anymore. Right, But um, it's an African-American museum, and it's one of the few places at the Smithsonian, or I guess in the area, where you see that kind of concentration of art by African-Americans. And how we mitigated that was we called the show Visual Art in the American Experience. Um, we only refer to artists as African-Americans, <coughs> as I said, when they wanted that moniker on them. And uh, we organized that show into various themes. Now, in terms of what we're doing now, we have the new show up, Reckoning, Protest, Defiance, Resilience. And this is a show talking about how African Americans have negotiated this issue of social justice in their work. And as a part of that, um, dealing with social justice, all of these artists are dealing with African American civil rights, right? And that, I think, in terms of doing all African-American shows, you need to do something that resonates with black artists. Um, you want it to be a theme show. You just don't want um, a group of African-American artists there that don't relate to one another in terms of their work. And it's, it's been a really interesting thing because I have been questioned on that. But this is the theme of the museum, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, even with collecting black artists who maybe have spent their entire career here in America, but they're not American citizens, we're also um, really limiting ourselves to doing art in this country, but there are certain artists that we've brought in. So even this idea of, <coughs> I think, expanding that to an international sort of viewpoint has been another thing that we wrestled with but we decided that we have a very limited space and we want to promote 
artists of African descent. And that's something we talk about as well, because not all artists come from this historical background in this country. So if you are a Nigerian artist and become an American citizen, the next day you will collect your work, right? So, and not all, and, and you have artists that consider, they're black, but they don't really consider themselves African American. Mm -hmm. So we also honor that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and Claudia, um, in terms of the conversation around, um, you know, labeling and um, uh, identity blindness that, you know, we, we've been brought up to believe, you know, colorblind is good, identity blindness is good, and artists wanting to be just part of shows with great artists versus artists, uh, shows with women or black artists. Um, how do you address that within your institution being the Jewish Museum? Well, it's... Can you hear me? Yeah. It's a complicated question I could sort of talk about us working right now on a show of all artists of color that are Jewish mm -hmm. um, at the museum and how to label that or not label it. The artists obviously do not want to. Mm -hmm. We understand that, um, but it's very complicated and we're, we're trying to help the curator now um, sort of guide her through that because it's, you know, they're also, also Jewish. So it's a, it's a double. But actually, I wanted to talk a little bit, and I told Marianne about um, being colorblind. Um, and in, so for several years, we were working with a project with Lawrence Wiener, who is, if you don't know, he's, um, he just passed away, but he is the statesman for conceptual art in the world. Um, he is Jewish. And we commissioned him to do a project on our facade before we knew the museums were going to be closed. This was just, we needed to activate our beautiful building. So we invited him to do a major, I would say poster, but it's not a poster, it wrapped the entire building. Um, and it was in Hebrew, Arabic, and English, and it said all the stars in the sky have the same face. And if you know Lawrence's work, it's bright blue with orange and white, and it was you know, extremely beautiful, so what are the issues? It's in Hebrew, Arabic, and English, and it's on the Jewish Museum. So people would, so I was the, the one in charge of this. We raised all the money, and um, we must have started this in 2017 to get permission to put this on our building. We're landmarked. So we went to the community board, and the community board three times turned us down. Now, for different reasons, because they said it belonged on the Upper West Side of New York, not because it belonged in their neighborhood, and by the time 2020 happened, they said, shouldn't you be focusing on how to open your museum, not how to wrap it? And so, um, if any of you know New York City, um, Upper West Side, signifies that that's where the kind of common folk Jews live. Let's just say the regular, you know, Upper East Side is definitely wealthier, and but everyone on this community board was, um, let's say, NJ, not Jewish. <laughs> and so, um, and, and I can say that because I'm the director of the Jewish Museum, and we, you know, we would, that was sort of, we, we got it because that's our mission. You know, they're either Jewish or not Jewish, but how can we bring them into the story? Because not everyone shows that the Jewish Museum is Jewish. So uh, we bypassed the community board, and because they kept on saying no, and we were told that we could go to, straight to landmarks. So we got 25 people, cultural people within our community of every color, race, background, discipline, in terms of the cultural dialogue to go downtown to present via Zoom this extraordinary project with Lawrence. And they just kept on saying, what's the issue here? This is fantastic. We would love to see this, not support it, but we would love to see it happen at the Jewish Museum. And all of these people, they said, we have never seen anything so well prepared because we were expecting them to say, Sorry, you can't, you know, you can't put that nail in the building and, you know, this, that, and the other. So June 2020 happens, and we have all the stars in the sky of the same face opening on our facade. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and it's already being, 
you know, the nails are going in, like, so to speak. And I just wake up one day and I'm like, we can't do this. We can't do this because it is very colorblind. Not all the stars in the sky have the same face. We don't all have the same face. Even though this is in Hebrew, Arabic, and English, and many people are of color, but it just didn't, I thought that, I, I just thought this would be a really bad thing for the Jewish Museum to do. So it's a big change. It, and so it, so it was like something, a light switch. And I said, OK, think differently. You thought this was such a beautiful project about peace and humanity and bringing everyone together. But then you realize that, in fact, so before I, and I wasn't going to cancel it, because canceling it would be just as bad. So I called every single one of those 25 people to say, how do they feel about us doing this? And some people said, don't, please don't. And, but the majority of people from every background said, no, just wait. Wait five, six months. I had to call Lawrence, and he did not understand this. He was also dying of cancer. And, but he wouldn't have understood it anyway, because he was coming from a totally different generation. Mm -hmm. And um, we, got, we hired a press, you know, outside press, in case it was you know, a, a mess, but in fact, Funnily enough, the world was in such chaos, it went unnoticed, um, <laughs> except, for, except for the art world. But I still think that we did the right thing by not opening it there and being a more conscious, more like our eyes are, you know, I they're not shut. And so this is a, I mean, even you were like, huh, you, you didn't do it? Mm -hmm. and, but yes, it, it, would, it just wouldn't look good, not only for the Jews, but for, for all of us in, in New York. So that's just condition. a small story. Um, but it's important because you're on the defensive all of a sudden. You know, you're working towards uh, something that you think is going to add, and you, well, you, as you a director, museum director, we look 360. We have to look behind our heads. You know, you know, we have to look to see. That's always the case because there's always going to be somebody, whether it's the community board or somebody who is just going to be against, and you're going to get letters. And we did. Some letters were like, "Wow, this is so great," and others letters, "How could you do this?" Still. Well, this is where and Jonathan actually um, occupies a very special <laughs> place as an independent um, curator and scholar. Um, could you talk to us a bit about curatorial activism? Sure. So I came into the field recognizing that Andy Warhol, Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Agnes Martin, Ellsworth Kelly, the entire pantheon of artists that represented America to itself seemed to be queer and nobody was talking about it. <laughs> um, and, um, and I also came up at a moment of the beginning of social and political activism around these issues and so brought the two of them together in pursuit of this. But this was a moment where questions of sexuality were still very much the third rail, in part because of the Maplethorpe brouhaha uh, that happened here in town, um, in which a museum had to cancel its Maplethorpe exhibition uh, preemptorily uh, for fear that it would fall afoul of government. And of course, what accompanied my career for the vast bulk of it was the fact that the art that we were talking about was also raw meat to uh, right-wing minions. And, um, and they were using it to raise money. And so when finally I was able to do uh, the show that became Hide Seek at the Smithsonian, um, it needs to be said that it went first to a number of private museums, not one of which was interested. They were well insulated. They had lots of money. They had cultural authority. It's telling, <clears throat> isn't it, that it was the publicly funded institution that took the risk. And it took the risk because they had done a series of exhibitions on the expansion of civil liberties. And I said, well, why can't you include this in those terms? So one of the things that I think needs to be said here is that um, it's still quite fraught. And of course, the question is sort of, do these artists want to be included in these terms? And frankly, 
And this is a luxury I have as, a, as, a, as an academic who also curates. I don't care what the artists think. <laughs> um, I don't because I'm responsive to a social and political movement and community that's much bigger than them. I should worry about people who leave billion dollar foundations and, and whether the, they, their feelings are hurt? No, right? I worry about people who may see themselves reflected on a wall for the first time in their life and find that sustaining. So that's the community I'm working for. And what queer art finally, and the ability to talk about queer art finally allows us to do is actually accurate art history, number one, because, you know, and I'm gonna name names, right? The, the, um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art did a retrospective on Robert Rauschenberg and they mentioned his marriage but they didn't mention his divorce. They didn't mention his longstanding relationship with Cy Twombly and his even longer relationship with Jasper Johns, leaving the impression, right, which they knew to be false, that he was uh, happily heterosexually married. This kind of stuff needs to end. And the art world um, is increasingly, I think, in the crosshairs of a culture war that um, we just have to keep our head down and keep doing it, and slowly this will pass. You know, dinosaurs squawk before they well, become but extinct. Con controversial question. How different would those artists' work have been had the culture been different, had they been out of the closet, had they had the freedom? So, you know, how much great art is made because of the oppression and, and the walls that need to be broken down? It's, it's a great question, and one of the things that I think is so telling about much of this work is their ability to work in code. Um, and, um, and that idea of repression animating so much. And that's the way I used to think, right, that, that in some horrific sense oppression was necessary for the greatness but because I was working on those artists. But it's the coding that allowed people to um, experience that art. It was a, It's what allowed it to be in the museums and because it was coded it was covered. So it was out there um, and, but it was only being discussed you know in certain circles but on the outside it had a totally different um, experience for the viewer. So it, I really think that as the curators and the, mus the institutions, your job is the framing. It's telling, it's the narrating, telling that story. And timing is, is a lot. Um, so uh, maybe Marilyn, you can tell us a bit about, you know, your experience with museums and, you know, how long it took for you to have uh, museum recognition and support <clears throat> and if they were open to the to the conversations that you were really um, tackling in your work? I don't think institutions, are, they're very conservative and they're very dogmatic. And um, I think, uh, you know, they, they have rigid rules almost. And artists are about being disturbing and breaking those rules. And uh, it's another language. And it's, took, it's taken a long time for institutions to pay attention to me, but I don't care. <laughs> you know, I, I, see that I was trying to say that at least I get to make what I want. When you get a lot of attention on you, you might not be able to. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so it's a kind of a freedom. Yeah. But they catch up to me sooner or later, like they catch up to everybody. I think it's fair. The art world is fair in the long run. That if you have something to say, it'll get seen. You're going to just be a lucky if you're still alive. Right. <clears throat> well, and what what about the <laughs> the institutional collections and the things that have been ignored and missed for so long? Everybody's the gaps, like, yeah. right? I didn't see when I saw uh, when I saw um, the first David Hammonds was 1992 at Exit Art. How do I even know about this artist? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It happens all the time. Well, that's where systemic. Yeah, um, that's what I see yeah. changing. If the, if they're finally paying attention to good art. Yeah. Uh, whether it's in the uh, language of, of the um, approved uh, institution or not, 
And institutions have to get some balls, I think. <laughs> and the communities need to broaden. Um, so because of what's been on view, we've only been taught and, and been shown certain things. In, I think, 2010, I went to um, a talk that um, Valerie Cassell Oliver was giving, and she had two projectors with slides, and it was a talk on New York art in the 1960s to today. And the slides went up, and you know, artist after artist was familiar. I knew, of course, you know, I did my art history. And then when she was done, she said, now I've got this other um, set of slides to show you. And up went slides of artists who were being shown above 125th Street. And it was all artists of color, artists that we now know and embrace, whether it's Carrie James Marshall, you know, on down. But in 2010, it was, it opened my eyes to realize that with all the studying that I had done um, in school and on my own and all the looking I had done, I was only looking in certain places and I was only reading and seeing certain content. So how do institutions make sure that they're A, showing the diverse um, sort of plethora of what is making um, culture today, and then making sure that there are counterparts out there who are communicating it? Maybe to Lisa, or, yeah, or Claudia, yeah. First of all, you have to hire curators of color. You have to hire curators that are going to be uh, either have studied it or are of color. I mean, because you, it, it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's a beginning, and I think every single museum in this country, um, certainly in New York City, has a diversity, equity, access, and inclusion plan, of which we have benchmarked ourselves um, with time to do X, Y, and Z in hiring and collecting and, and things like that. So that progress is being made. I will say that it is very hard to find a curator of color to come to the Jewish Museum at the same time. So we, um, it's not impossible, but it is, it, it is not that easy because it, it's just, it's not, you really have to search and do your digging more as opposed to just expect it to come to you. It's not going to come to you. So um, I'm going to hand this over yeah. to you, but it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility. We have to, to be proactive. So yes. we shouldn't be doing Absolutely. blind hiring either. So we need to be proactively Absolutely. seeking out diverse hiring. Yes. Absolutely. Um, that's an interesting point because I'm an Americanist and I study art and do shows that don't contain African American artists you know, depending on a show, because we did Lewis Comfort Tiffany, so you can't include African American artists. But, you know, we don't have just people of color on our curatorial staff. So we don't see necessarily race as a barrier to knowledge. And when I was coming up in the art world, I did not want to just be regulated to artwork of color. And one of the things I was very concerned about was um, being hired. It's a historically white art museum gonna hire me. They weren't hiring at the time, right? Except for the Dayton Art Institute. But I finished my dissertation. I actually purposely, very intentionally, created a dissertation on a white artist, mid 19th century history painter that did issues of slavery and freedom in his work because I wanted to show basically that I can do things that are not necessarily African-American based. Um, and I also did it with an emphasis on history because knowing the field, knowing the difficulty I was going to be hired under, I thought I might have to work for a history and culture museum, which was the case even though I didn't apply to too many institutions at that time. I got the job right away. And, um, and then when we do that show, as I said earlier, we make sure that it's under the rubric of American art, right? So we want to bring African-American artists who've been ignored because of racism and segregation into that space. And artists that are unknown to maybe the wider art world, uh, but have always been known within the African-American sphere. And I grew up with that. And it's really interesting now because when I started at the museum, I made a concerted effort to bring in these artists. And, and they were affordable. 
at the time. Now they're artists that we brought in to the museum that we can't afford because now historically white museums are buying them and trying to you know, change that history of exclusion. So you know, I just think it's very interesting because I've had issues with not wanting to be pigeonholed. Right. Right? Um, I studied African American, I mean, I studied American history painting and I studied landscape painting from the 19th century. <laughs> so I'm also not a contemporary person. I'm a generalist, but I didn't study contemporary art. And what I do really find interesting is that um, African Americans are generally hired and generally study contemporary art. I'm like an albatross. Right, <laughs> but I also have a friend who studies French art, right? But she's always asked to do shows dealing with African Americans. So, but then therein lies the the rub. If yeah. if we are proactively seeking black curators, for example, the Jewish Museum, there's going to be you know a, sort of a labeling or presumption that you're going to focus on black art and not necessarily your own discipline, right? So how do you demystify even the process for people when they're out, when the museum directors are out searching? A few things here is one is, is that at the Jewish Museum, most of the staff is not Jewish and, mm -hmm. and most of our curators are not Jewish. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter, but we felt that we needed to make a, a concerted effort to find somebody who was a person of color Absolutely. because that's part of our um, DEAI plan. We did not succeed, but yeah. that's okay. Yet. Yeah, <laughs> but but that's that's okay, and you know we're still fulfilling our mission, or fulfilling our goals. And then I'll pass it on to Jonathan, who I think yeah. is going to. I, I just wanted to say that I think one of the interesting things that needs to be understood here is that in many respects, race is overdetermined, and although it's lessening today, gender is still overdetermined as a factor in understanding what an artist is doing whereas sexuality is underdetermined, right? So we're in a kind of interesting moment where nobody can claim that there aren't queer artists on display in museums all across the world. There are tons of them. What's not being shown, of course, is the discursive, right? The content, the meaning, the relationship to sexuality. And so I'm invested not in sort of the politics of representation in terms of changing right, the board or whatever, I'm interested in getting the word out that we need to think differently about these figures. Mm -hmm. So well, I've just um, seen the card that we're supposed to be moving on to the Q&A. So um, I guess I should be wrapping up, but thank you all for your thoughts and comments. And um, I wish we had more time. Honestly, there's so much here to dig into. So. Hello, Sarah Arison. Thank you all so much for your time today. Um, Marilyn, I was really interested. You said <clears throat> that you found women artists or uh, you know, underrepresented, marginalized um, through art magazines. And I was wondering if you still feel that art magazines are a place to discover these artists or are cultural institutions doing a better job? Is it through curators? Is it through social media? Um, where do you think that these artists who um, might not be taught in schools or might not be seen otherwhere can be discovered now? That's a good question. I, you know, as an artist, I'm always looking for art that represents the times I live in. And, uh, you know, I, that's, a, that's something I don't know how to do, is find good new artists. I do think t things are changing. And um, I see that, uh, that uh, women artists are getting a one-person shows in museums, that's brand new. I think that's, we're never gonna go backwards. I think, you know, there's just the idea of, of sharing power scares a lot of people. And my age group of men, uh, you know, they didn't have, I mean, this is my opinion, they didn't have, uh, uh, my, well, when I, when I was a kid, I mean, you, our mothers were nurses or, um, they were uh, librarians or teachers, and a, and a glamorous job would be an airline stewardess. Mm -hmm. That was a glamour job. Whereas this generation has chil ha ch children, boys and girls, have mothers, they're CEOs and lawyers, and 
Supreme Court justices. And that's going to change everything. So people, I think it's really a matter of people wrapping their brain around women are just equally as, as, uh, as talented as, as, as uh, men. And, and people of color are equally talented as, uh, you know, there's not this hierarchy of, of talent. And uh, that is really uh, hearts and minds. <clears throat> Hi, Fred Hochberg, I'm a trustee here. Uh, part of art is supposed to be provocative, disturbing, offensive, not just pretty. So how do we square that with our cultural identities today? Because it's, you know, we, we don't really want to get into, you know, we then start banning books, we start doing censorship, so how do we, how do we navigate that? And I think about that professor at Hamlin College, or Hamlin College, who was teaching about Islamic art, had the image of Muhammad, gave many warnings about it, and there was still an outcry. So how do we figure that out in this era? Well, I, at the Smithsonian, as you know, um, it's very conservative. It's considered a family museum. People don't expect to see nudity or things about sex, unless it's from the 18th century. Some, <laughs> sometimes that's OK, but contemporary nudity is problematic. And I remember I was looking at this work by artist Victor Epoch that I loved. And it was a union of Saint and Venus, which talks about a pope impregnating a black woman and their child actually um, ran, he gave, he's the only one who acknowledged that child. But the imagery is of the pope with very provocative imagery of um, enslaved people wearing collars and um, talking about runaway slaves and all of that. And he also has his papal staff, which has been made to look like a penis, going into uh, this prone woman who represents a hot and tot Venus in Africa in general. So I was very concerned. I looked at that piece for three years, deciding whether or not I was going to pick that piece up. And in the end, I said, stop censoring yourself. Bring that piece in. Our director at the time was like, if you can defend it, bring it in. And all of that concern was for not. Nobody has complained about that painting. But you can talk about Congress and how that happened, because we report to Congress as well. So that is an issue. Sexual imagery is very loaded. Yeah. But I, but I think the, the key to thinking about this is to understand that whereas the United States used to be very much ahead of the rest of the world in terms of breaking new ground in representation, the fact that we are now funded primarily by the wealthy private donor has made our museum culture incredibly conservative and we are being outpaced internationally. Mm -hmm. um, I just did a show on trans art in Panama that I couldn't do in the United States, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what we need to understand is until we have a museum system that is absolutely invested in demographic spread mm -hmm. as our population, right, we're going to keep on doing essentially what 1% demands. Hi, Sue Wrigley. Are you then saying that um, the wealthy donors and trustees are dictating the curatorial purview at institu institutions? I would say that they're dictating it, but not in the sort of easy way, which is to say that they're not saying you can't show that or you do that. But directors bring projects to their board of directors and the board of directors can fund or not fund. Um, and very quickly, directors come to understand what the boundary lines are. And tellingly, one, and I'm not going to give his name because he's very publicity shy, but one very, very wealthy man in this country has just opened up a museum called Wrightwood 659 in Chicago because he's been on the board of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's been on the board of the Met. And he realized that all the progressive uh, curatorial proposals were being shot down or not funded. And so he hired Tadao Ando to build him this magnificent new museum, and now there's a five-story museum whose purpose is to pick up the strays. 
I, I hear you, but at the Jewish Museum, this is not, not the case. Um, first of all, board does not fund our shows. We, board does fund us, but we get funding, and most museums, from a cross-section of the project that would be of interest to that person to fund. So um, I think that our board, and I don't want to speak for others, is that they would say, okay, this is interesting, where do you see the issues here, and then we solve those problems. But we, they don't, it's not because we're not getting, it's, it's not about funding. I think that we are not, we are not risk averse, the Jewish Museum, for various reasons, and, um, and I, I think generally supported across the board. There's not been one show that has been shot down because, and there's been a lot of controversial shows or shows that, you know, we invited Jonathan Horowitz during, um, before anti-Semitism, be, during the beginning of anti-Semitism in Trump to do a show addressing anti-Semitism and he wanted to do it on um, uh, xenophobia, hate, bigotry, homophobia, the whole kind of, and, you know, sadly it opened in March 2020 and it was opening in the fall, you know, so we, but it was just like, let's, and we didn't invite a curator to do a show on anti-Semitism because that would be, we would have, there had been too many holes there. So that was what we said immediately is that we couldn't ask a curator to do it because you can't cover that topic. So you invite an artist whose subject matter is, is political and social, and it was through his eyes that he did this show. So, yeah, we had some concerns, but nothing, nothing that it wouldn't be moved forward. And no, hardly anyone funded that show. But uh, we I still did it. I think so, we are out of time. So, so I um, agree, but, but disagree. Keep going okay. here. <laughs> um, thank you all so much. Uh, <laughs>
Yes. Test. Okay, folks, we're going to start our next panel momentarily. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you to take your seats. You definitely do not want to miss this next panel. Thank you, thank you. everybody, welcome to the grand finale. Um, my name's Eric Gottesman. I'm, uh, I'm an artist and one of the co-founders of Four Freedoms. Um, we, Four Freedoms curated this show that's here in the Meridian Gallery along with TK. Um, and uh, and we are an artist, arts, artist-led organization um, making projects and installations and events all around the country to engage uh, artists and arts community in, in more civic action and in, uh, into kind of thinking of themselves as political agents. Um, I want to first start out with some thank yous. Thank you to TK, Harvey, and Sylvie Stanton, and many others here at the Meridian Center. Um, many others, including people who aren't here, like Ellen Sussman and Randy Levine from the Art and Embassies program. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge the other artists in the room who are part of this exhibition, Kobe Kennedy, and Hank Willis-Thomas, and Nikisha Durrett. Um, who you'll hear from in a moment, as well as uh, Martha Jackson Jarvis and Shada Soleimani, whose work is over here. Uh, and to the curators of the show, one of whom is here, June. Where are you, June? June M Mabuchi, he's probably in the back. The front row. He's right in the front row. <laughs> and Michelle Wu, um, our partner uh, at Four Freedoms. And we're doing a series, series of events throughout this weekend uh, in support of the Queen City Project that Nikisha has, has uh, somehow made and, and birthed into the world. Um, it's, it's epic. Uh, and our partners throughout this weekend include Stable Arts, um, the Rubel Museum in DC, Red Dirt Studios, and Arlington Arts. Um, and you know, we at Four Freedoms, we like to put artists right in the center of all conversations. Um, often, like you were saying, Marilyn, institutions follow those artists. Um, including policy conversations. And the conceit of our work is that, that change always starts in the margins where artists like to dwell, and by bringing artists to the center, we're accelerating that change. Uh, and so that's, that's what we are mainly doing. Um, and, and we're here in, in large part in DC, um, in a large, I live here, but we're here in a large presence uh, this weekend uh, to celebrate um, a project, Queen City, that's, that's kind of a gleaming example of how participation um, can shift how we relate to our cities, to our communities, and to our societies. Uh, it's also a, an incredible project that, that, talk, that touches on healing and how we create models for repair. Um, Nikisha Durrett made that project, uh, and it commemorates the 903 individuals that were displaced by the building of the Pentagon in Arlington, uh, Virginia. Uh, she worked with black ceramicists throughout the country, many of whom are here in the room today. You could stand up if you were part of the project. Uh, 
Um, and, and they all made vessels that will sit inside a brick tower of, of Nikisha's design in a permanent installation in Arlington that commemorates these, these people displaced by eminent domain. And this weekend marks the opening of the public sculpture at Memorial Park in Arlington, um, which, will, which will open with a commemorative ceremony at 1 p.m. tomorrow, so please join us. Um, and it is an outgrowth of Nikisha's expansive artistic practice. Hank Willis Thomas went to high school with Nikisha uh, and is my good friend and is one of the country's most preeminent artists and thinkers on issues related to art and democracy and many other things. Uh, he is everywhere, both artistically, his work has probably been in a museum you have visited recently, uh, as well as physically. He flew in last night from Paris and uh, is flying out tomorrow to Portugal. So we are very lucky to have him here today. Uh, Maria Fernanda Garcia Velasco is currently serving as the cultural attache to the Embassy of Uruguay in the United States. She previously served as Director of Consular Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Uruguay, where she oversaw the, Cit the Center for Citizen Services and collaborated in the assistance of Uruguayan nas nationals abroad. And these three will be in discussion today in a conversation moderated by retired General Nolan Bivens, President and CEO of Americans for the Arts and a lifelong supporter of the arts. Nolan? Thank you. Test it. Got it. Good. Well, thank you so very much. I'm very honored to be here today, uh, without a doubt. And uh, thanks, first of all, is what I'd like to give to a lot of people that made it possible to be here. Uh, Mom always said, give thanks when you go into a house the first time. So I want to thank all of the indigenous uh, people on whose land we sit today. I'm sure that acknowledgement has already happened, but they make it possible for us to be here. I'd like to also thank the panelists that are sitting here with me because they are the ones just contributing to the communities here that's making a difference. And I'd like to also just thank Marian and the whole family of uh, what you all have offered us an opportunity to participate and celebrate with you. And last but not least, certainly everyone that's sitting here that's breathing the same air, I appreciate you being here and I'm excited to have this conversation, so thanks so very much. Uh, my first task is to say this is a conversation up here on the stage first, and I've challenged uh, my participants to, to challenge each other as we go through these questions. And I'd ask you uh, as an audience, uh, you know, from the question and answer period that will follow, I wanna, I wanna set a question up in your mind that we're gonna to work towards. So you get to participate even as you listen in here. And the question I wanna to leave to the group writ large is uh, found in this, in this idea of uh, what lies beyond democracy. And we're gonna talk about democracy and the arts and culture and the ways that it impact, but I'd like you to kind of plant that seed as we start the conversation. What, what lies beyond democracy? So to, to get us going here, uh, I was told that you are very creative, right? So uh, I'm current, one of the books that's on my uh, side shelf is a, is a book by an author. His name is Makoto Fugamuru, and the title of the book is Arts Plus Faith. And in that, he centers the notion of how creativity is a part of all of his work. And that's also for you, Maria. You can tell the same. Uh, but what I'd like to first ask you in your prompt of sorts is, um, what is your relationship with creativity in terms of the work that you do as an artist? All right, this is gonna be kind of a, a strange story to, to share, um, but it relates to a, um, a memory. Um, and I can remember as a small kid, um, having this, this flash of a moment where, um, where I can only describe it as a memory of being in the womb, where it feels at one time um, a very like com compressed sensation of being in a very compressed space, but also vast and expansive. And it, that vastness and expansiveness, I think of like, it just felt like the universe. And I can remember spending much of my childhood trying to replicate that sensation. 
it would be like, well, the lighting conditions were this way. Uh, you know, I was asleep. I had just woken up. Like, I, trying to figure out how to set the conditions to experience that expansiveness again. Um, and I think that as I grew into adulthood, that um, making art was that way of communing with that expansiveness. And that expansiveness is like, you know, it's everything. It's everyone. It's the sensation that we are all connected. And so that's kind of what I feel like my creativity is for me. Great, thanks. Hank, you want to jump on that grenade next? Or? OK. Please. Please. It's a military <laughs> reference uh, I, I have not, no familiarity with. Um, I. Uh, was well, just meditating on Lakeisha's story. So uh, I th know that we all make infinite creative decisions every moment of our life, most of which are subconscious. And a lot of what I've been really curious about is where does consciousness and creativity uh, intersect with the latent uh, wisdom it, we call ancestral intelligence that's in our uh, subconscious. And so uh, when I talk about the infinite decisions, it's the green pants that Marilyn and I chose to wear today. Um, uh, but the, all of the things that each of us, every, like from getting up this morning to what you did first, for check your phone or brush your teeth or, or quaff your hair or kiss <coughs> someone, these are all creative decisions on how we start to enter our day. And then what we choose to walk out of our womb, of our home, into the world, presenting, and how we interact with someone. I had someone this morning uh, at the train station from New York say, I was asking where, where the track was. He was like, why don't we start off with good morning? And I was like, <laughs> that is a very, you know, that was a reminder of like how I was unconsciously engaging in my creativity of finding my my way to, uh, to, to, to get here. And so I really am more and more uh, looking for ways to kind of acknowledge that everything I do is creative and mm -hmm. allow for that to be something that others can share in so it doesn't just exist in an artifact on a wall, uh, but actually that people sense it in the way that we interact. And uh, Eric would say I'm getting better at it every day. <laughs> All right, super. He doesn't have a mic, so it's easy to speak for him. <laughs> Maria, what about you? Well, for me as a career diplomat, um, I have to be very creative. Um, the Uruguayan Foreign Service isn't very large, so sometimes we're um, in charge of different areas. Um, when I was first posted to Paris, I was going to be in charge of um, economic and commercial affairs. A short time after arriving, um, I was named consul of Uruguay in Paris, and I had never had a consular role in the ministry, so I was faced with learning um, how to serve um, the Uruguayan community in France in a different way. So always trying to find new, so you, as a consul, you, you always have different situations. You're like, oh, this can only happen to me, but you always have to find a creative solution to give for these people because you're the only you're the only hope sometimes when you're abroad. So, um, in my job, we do that all the time, every day. Um, and now I'm in charge of the cultural area of the embassy. So, as well, um, always trying to find creative solutions um, because we never have enough funds or the resources for certain cultural activities. Luckily, I have a foundation through which I can finance. Um, the promotion of Uruguayan culture at the embassy. Um, well, I can give you a little bit more of my background um, later on in the discussion, but. Oh, that's, that's good, I, and I know the audience probably wonders why he threw that question on the table at the start here. I, I, I do it because uh, in my moving around, I've discovered, one uh, writer had said something that really made me begin to realize that, you know, we, at the core of everything we do is creativity. Right? And he said it this way, he says, you know, if you think about the world and all that we experience, it comes from two sources. It comes from the earth and the creativity of someone else that put that together, right? All that we know. And I think that's a kind of an intangible way of not realizing from a democracy perspective, you know, that we're in that same exercise of creativity. 
you know, Amanda Goldman said it extremely well in her opening remarks uh, in, in the inaugural that we are not broken, we're just unfinished. This idea that we're continually moving towards something that is better. So let's jump into the, uh, the pool real quickly here on, on this. What do you consider, uh, and, and you can share this with me, this is for both you, Nikita and also for Hank. Uh, as you look at the work that you've done, uh, can you share some background on uh, like Four Freedoms and how you got it going and what made the connections and maybe some of the collaborations that you've done? But how did you get into that from kind of the public perspective and tying it to maybe democracy and citizenship? Sure, so uh, there, uh, we, Kobe, Nikisha, and I are uh, beneficiaries from a creative civic servant, um, uh, Peggy Cooper Kafritz, who is now deceased, who but was a legend in Washington, D.C. for 50 plus years through her connection between Capitol Hill and the museums. And she co-founded Duke Ellington School of the Arts, where uh, the three of us went, um, graduating almost 30 years ago. And or almost graduating. <laughs> or almost graduating, <laughs> right. But who's um, counting? <laughs> and, and then the three of us also went to three different colleges in New York at the same time. Um, but I would say, if anything, what Peggy did for us in, was create a model for what a creative community could really be like. We were in school every day from 8.30 to 5 p.m. at least, um, engaging with other creatives, um, man people manifesting their dreams. I was in the Museum Studies program, so everyone manifested laughter at me, because you know they're like, what do you guys do? Do you write labels? <laughs> <laughs> um, however, um, I feel like we um, really did community building. Um, and, and, and thought about collaboration, and, and Kobe was doing uh, street writing. I don't know if I could say anything was illegal in this space, but <laughs> but um, I, I, my mind was blown by what an artist could do and how, what an artist can be. And um, for over the past uh, years, we've kind of done things apart. Kobe went to Japan, Nikisha was in, in Michigan and other places, and I was in uh, New York. But each of us were watching each other follow different dreams, and those dreams get to intersect as new people, like Eric, 20 years late, twenty years ago, <laughs> entered uh, our, our, our community, and Sam Giarratani seven years ago. And what I really benefit from, and I see Sarah Arison, who's been a, 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 a spirit guy with us for a long time, um, is, and I see Virginia Shore, and Sylvie, uh, and Sue. Uh, but there's, I really love the fact that what we have done, there's a stickiness to it. And that we can um, actually bring our collective creativity into something. And, and you were in our very first exhibition, giving us credibility as Four Freedoms at Jack Shaman Gallery. And so thank you so much um, for your belief in what we can do. Um, in listening to you talk about um, Duke Ellington, one phrase that um, jumps to the top of my mind is how I would often hear this phrase like that Duke Ellington saved, saves lives. And, and I think that typically when, when people say that, they're often speaking of, um, you know, as part of Ellington's mission to to bring in um, to bring in artists who are kind of like at the fringes of society and don't have young artists at the fringes who don't have access to um, to a means of of making art, um, and that wasn't necessarily the case for me. Um, I, you know, my parents would take me to museums and buy me whatever art materials I had or whatever, but I was someone who felt alienated in a you know typical high school setting and just felt kind of lost and just felt, you know, really felt at the fringe. And it wasn't until I came to Ellington to be around other artists and I met Hank and I met Kobe and so many other people that I felt um, truly seen and I think that that is something that we that we all want. Um, 
those you know foundational modes of um, uh, healthy attachment, feeling seen, heard, and supported. And I think that for me, that was what being in this creative space with other artists did. I felt truly seen. Thank you so much. I'm going to follow up. I have to, uh, that was the first time the Keisha's ever referred to me as an artist, by the way. Oh! oh, 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 oh news oh. breaking, news breaking. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you're going to get me in trouble. Uh, Maria, I'd like you to kind of do a similar kind of summary of, of your, your experiences uh, being a uh, individual from from the rest of America. I'm going to say that in a very deliberate way. And and you and I have had some conversations about that. And, and on the backside, we'll hopefully share with the audience of how you and I intersect, even though we didn't know each other from, from previous background, around the one word called America. Yes. Well, Uruguay is considered um, by The Economist uh, the number one democracy in, in America, in the Americas. So, you know, for Consistently, we've been at the top of the charts comparing the democracies in, in the hemisphere. Um, we've rated higher than the US, and that, um, that really surprises people. When we have meetings with students and receive groups at the embassy, they're, they're very surprised by that. Um, a lot of people don't know anything about Uruguay. <laughs> That's very common. Where is that? Where, you know, I've been asked, is Uruguay in Africa? No, it is not in Africa. <laughs> Uruguay is, it was created as a buffer state between Brazil and Argentina. Um, we're on the Atlantic coast of South America. Montevideo is the southernmost capital in the world. Um, I've had people argue with me that um, we don't have, we're, on, we're not on the ocean. That was, yes, we are. <laughs> um, no, I, I actually had that discussion with a taxi driver in France years ago, so it was, it was very interesting. I myself, um, I was born in Uruguay um, a, a month after the dictatorship started. Um, so I lived the dictatorship in Uruguay for four years, um, visiting, trying to see my father in prison. My father was a political prisoner for, for some time. He, dis he would disappear for months. Um, I have many memories of that, even though I was a young child. My family um, escaped Uruguay. We lived in Argentina for a couple of months waiting um, for refugee status for some country to accept us. And the dictatorship in Argentina started when we were there. So I was able to live through a lot of really tough situations as a young child. Um, luckily, we were able to move to Canada. Um, Canada accepted us. We moved to Canada. My, my father, um, he traveled with a Red Cross passport um, because he didn't have Uruguayan documents at the time. So when we arrived in Canada, um, I ended up living there for 17 years. Um, we were able to visit Uruguay again when, when Uruguay um, returned to democracy in, after 80, 1985. And I visited Uruguay as a child or as, as an adolescent. And then I, re I revisited Uruguay when I was 18. And I fell in love with the country. My parents, you know, growing up, my parents always had that idea, you know, we were political refugees, but they didn't, they didn't want to stay in Canada. They didn't have that ideal of escaping Uruguay and, and, you know, making a new life abroad. They always had that idea at the back of their minds of returning to their, to their roots, always listening to Uruguayan music, Uruguayan protest, folk music, protest music, um, Uruguayan literature. Um, that was always very present in my life. And when I was 18, I was able to visit my country um, for three months on my own without my parents. So I was able to discover my people, my society, and I truly fell in love with the country. So when the opportunity arose for me to return to Uruguay, um, I was like, okay, I'm going back. I, get, I went back to Uruguay with my parents in my early 20s. And, um, you know, I eventually ended up studying international relations in my country. And you know, I, I was in love with my country, and a lot of Uruguayans didn't realize how lucky they were. The great country that they had, it's a country of 3.5 million people. Um, they always you know, traditionally looked at Europe, looked at the US as an example. And when I returned, I would talk to people and say, you have to value what you have. You are so lucky, and to have recovered this democracy and, and defend it, and defend your resources, defend your culture, it has value. We have a very rich culture, even though it's a small country and maybe we, you know, 
for the amount of people that we have, we do produce a lot of great art, great music, great literature. Um, and really, as a, as a diplomat, I I like to show that to people. I, I you know I want to make that known to the world, and also for Uruguayans to know to appreciate what they have. I think that's very important um, to know their place in the Americas, to know that they have a voice, to know that what they create is valid, and you know we can compete in you know in the art world. We we have things of value to share with the world. So. Thank you so very much. Uh, You're welcome. To kind of connect the dot there about America's, uh, the commonality, I spent uh, about two and a half years as the uh, chief of staff at U.S. Southern Command in Miami, and we were responsible for all of Latin, Central, South America in terms of military connections. And we do a lot of diplomatic relationships throughout the hemisphere there. And you and I talked about this idea of America, the United States having appropriated the term America is something that belongs to us versus the hemisphere. And all of us are Americans because we're in this hemisphere. So I'm so excited to have you on this, this panel this morning because you bring that broader perspective to it. So kind of going now a little bit closer towards the artists and democracy, uh, what I, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, again, you know, Hank, and I'll flip back and forth between you and Natisha. Um, what, can you just share a little bit of how you see artists' contribution within democracy, within a community? And I want you to start at the community level, not get too big in terms of the level, but how do you see artists being contributory to democracy at the community level? Well, when I go back to the founding of this country, and of course, um, our founding fathers were not only slaveholders, by and large, they also were artists. They were also poets and writers and entrepreneurs um, and dreamers. And there's a complexity that I had to negotiate with being a patriot um, while also acknowledging the um, deep flaws of the people who have provided the space for me to exist in many ways. Uh, and, but when I do read those stories of you know the, the um, Constitutional Congress in the um, writing of the Declaration of Independence, this, these were creative collaborative acts. A lot of voices, most of the voices, uh, were left out at the time and, and they were appropriating from indigenous wisdom that they had learned over the, past, the previous 300 years. Um, however, I can't help but to acknowledge, to, 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 to salute the fact that the creative storytelling that um, they um, collectively worked on um, as writers, as poets, as visual artists, um, to tell a story so good that when I, yeah, I'm in France, I'm in Port, like we're all here, and we believe fundamentally that something that was, that those creative people did was worth preserving in spite of all of their clear myopia and maybe in misdeeds done in the name of freedom and, and, and uh, creating a more perfect union. And so when I think about them, I think about us. We are, none of us will be judged kindly by the uh, microscope of history. However, I think we all have the same potential of collectively uh, designing a, a pathway um, that future generations will celebrate. And I think we are living at a fortunate time where it seems as though this democracy is falling apart at its, at its threads, and perhaps we're getting a chance to sew it together in a new way. And rather than uh, you know, contributing to the tearing apart, um, really as creatives taking the responsibility of telling the story that we can all um, embrace. Right. Right. Yeah, I think um, I think that for me, it's um, one of the th things that appeals to me about making art in public spaces is that I think that art and out, art that is out in the world, out in public, um, it creates this sort of democratized space where um, you know people from all walks of life can can experience this work. Um, 
in the, in the case of Queen City, which I think is re really special about about the project, is that you know at at multiple levels in the process, I was thinking about about absence and about erasure. So I was thinking about you know the the absence and the telling of the story of um, the people of Queen City um, who were erased from our cultural memory. Um, and then I was also thinking about a group of ceramicists, um, black ceramicists, who are excluded from the broader conversation of, um, of the ceramics world. Um, so it was an opportunity for me to, to bring the story about um, the people of Queen City, but also to elevate the, the extraordinary practices of these artists that I've been privileged to, to know. Throughout this, you you so you say so eloquent. This idea of intersectionality, right? That a lot of the social uh, injustices that we're dealing with are multi-layered and, and they intersect in so many ways, right? Uh, particularly around the notion of not just the history, but also those who are now existing in the presence as a result of that history, which are the artists. And one of the things fascinating, as I was sharing with Eric earlier this morning, that makes this really profound for a nation, I think, is the idea that is putting the artist back into the center of the conversation at the table, in the dialogue, in the creation, right? And that piece has kind of escaped, I think, a little bit of that public dialogue. But into that same space, how do you see art as, from your perspective, in the other part of America, <laughs> uh, of the Americas, uh, how do you see that, that play of art and artists re inside of your democracy? Well, in the creation of Uruguayan democracy, um, art has always artists have always had a role, I believe. Um, you see the the early great artists, the great masters. They they tried to create a national identity. Um, the country was we declared independence in 1825. Our first constitution was in 1830. It was imposed, even though it was um, it was modeled on on the American. Um, the American Revolution, all these ideas that, that you were talking about, all these great ideas. So a lot of our thinkers um, did come from Europe. Um, the indigenous communities were, were wiped out in the 1830s. There was um, a series of civil wars in my country um, through the mid-1800s. And um, in the early um, 20th century, there was a constitutional reform that tried to give a voice to um, and gave a space to to the people that had been excluded from the previous constitution, and a lot of um, there was artists that um, they also participated in government. There's one artist, Figari, which is one of my favorites. Um, he was a lawyer, a poet, a painter. Um, he he held a position in government. He was a public defender. Um, and he painted um, rural scenes with Creoles, with blacks, with, with gauchos. He painted funerals, um, folk festivals. So in a way, his painting showed a part of the society that wasn't seen in, you know, in the political circles. And they part the artists would participate in round tables and in cafes. They had that European idea of having different thinkers come together and, and share ideals. So that did have an influence in the creation of the country and in the successive um, renegotiations of our constitution. And the democratic institutions were made stronger and stronger as as the country evolved. And artists did have a voice in that, and the, the artistic expressions did have a voice in, in that process, in that creation of that, you know, that sense of patriotism or that national identity. Well, thank you, and time has gone. <laughs> and I want to turn to the audience to see if there are any uh, specific questions that you may have, and as, as you raise your hand or not. But I, I, I kind of will just say that it's been really a pleasure to have this conversation with you, and I think the point of well, what lies beyond democracy right now is how do we cause artists to continue to be at the center of that discussion? How do we live out the, the expressions of what you, the project and what you all are doing? And as uh, I was kind of, I think, thinking earlier and, and talking with Acacia, the question to me is, 
how many more queen villages are there out there right, that have not been told, right? So what are your questions and comments that you may have? I know we got very short time, so please. do the honors? Okay, thank you. I'm curious about um, just class in the sense of being an artist and the way that you guys are understanding inclusivity and the idea of like communal engagement when we talk about public art. I'm curious about that in the sense of like the artist's role within the government, the artist's role within like really swaying the collective or even like bringing voice to the collective in ways that like government systems cannot do. I'm curious about class in that sense and like how you guys navigate like that idea in the way that like what, where you find art, what art is for, right? If it's not public art, we can't come and walk by it. The museum spaces, the gallery spaces, class is like a large kind of like elephant in the room in that, in that way, you know, in the sense of who's really getting access to what. So I'm curious. Um, yeah, that's for the whole panel. Well, I, I, I can start, I guess, in a way. Um, well, I see art as a tool of social inclusion. So, you know, our Ministry of Culture, I'm a bureaucrat <laughs> at the end. No, like our Ministry of Education and Culture, they, they see that, that connection between education and culture. Uruguay has universal free education, mandatory education, university. We have free public university in my country. So that's an important part of forming a society as well and strengthening the democracy and giving people a voice and using s these tools for, for social inclusion because there are sectors of the society that, you know, they are vulnerable. They, they aren't part of the, of the mainstream. So it's important to give them a voice and take that art, the art to them as well. We have many um, public museums all over the country. We have um, exhibitions that are sent to different, to different towns to make that tangible to, for people. We had an exhibit um, at our embassy that showed the peaceful transition of, of power in Uruguay over the past 35 plus years since the end of the dictatorship. So it shows how different political parties, um, they would participate in the peaceful passing of power from one party to another, from one sector within the same um, political party to another. And that was a peaceful transition. And people having lost the democracy for so many years and having lost their freedoms and having been censored, um, you know, this this um, this exhibition was um, was shown throughout the country. Over 100,000 people saw it, and they, you know, they really appreciated and they really, you know, realized. Well, we have to defend this. This is important. Um, democracy is not negotiable. You know, obviously, it's not something that's set in stone, and we can always improve on what we have. We still have quite a ways to go, but I think there's. Um, there's that sense in my country where, you know, we we know that we can die. We ha we have a dialogue. We're open to dialogue. Um, we're open to participation, and we don't necessarily tear down the society or tear tear down the structures to move forward. So we can move forward together, and creating those inclusive space and art and culture and you know coming together. That's very important. Um, I, I think that the reason why I started making work in public spaces was because of um, exclusionary practices that I that I perceived in um, in museums and, and gallery spaces. Um, I found the conversations that I was having with people about my work much more interesting and compelling, just with like everyday people who probably feel would feel really uncomfortable going into a museum um, or or a gallery space um, so I, I still haven't quite I don't really have like a gallery or um, a, a huge like museum presence so that's something that I'm still navigating um, just recently I had the privilege of work working with the Baltimore Museum of Art and I feel like that is an institution who just gets it right on every level. Um, you know, when I met with 
like I met with the entire staff just to mount one piece of art on the wall. And so I see this democratization where it's not like certain people, like it's just the curator in the meeting or the director. Um, it's the lighting person, it's the art handler, like we're all there and having, being someone who worked in a museum and did not feel that it was an equitable space while I was working there, it's really heartening to see that, everyone coming to the table and making decisions. And you know, just with that as my history and being a black woman artist and like I felt so supported in that space and really seen and understood um, so I think that's part of it. Yeah. Want to take us home? Sure. I'll jump on this grenade. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, I saw. I said I saw someone with uh, who appeared to be a veteran, American veteran, with a, no leg the other day, and I just can't help but think about those sacrifices and. Um, the metaphor is just like jarring because I'm like, oh, would I do that? No. Okay, now I'm getting asked to do that in such a safe <laughs> environment. Um, but um, I also am really good at putting my foot in my mouth, so go figure. Uh, I think about when we think of um, the four most prominent, arguable creative movements in the 20th century. They were all born out of the creativity of poor people. Wealthy people rarely do anything that amazing. <laughs> um, so when you think about jazz, you think about rock and roll, you think about hip hop, think about reggae, or even salsa music, which each has a, has a, a fashion component, has a visual arts component, and has uh, an impact on the way that uh, whole societies are built. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, as a person who grew up in museums and my mom's a curator, my wife's a curator, um, I, I sometimes feel like, um, and I was in museum studies, <laughs> um, that museums are places where, are the final resting place for creativity, you know? And as I become more uh, successful and accepted uh, and aim to be even more, I also wonder to what degree I am diminishing my own ability to contribute uh, conduct productively to um, the next great movements, right? Because each of us assimilates at some point and becomes institutionalized, and that's usually when we stop um, being willing to take the risks. Um, with that actually can actually keep a society going. And so it's not to romanticize anything, but also to acknowledge that when we think about the, the spaces that we're trying to get into, when we look around <laughs> and we think about who built the spaces, you know, now we are, we be, we are becoming the them that we were kind of making work in spite of. And so I, I, I navigate that complexity um, and hope to model it in a way that is not, um, that hopefully is both problematic, but in a creative sense. Thank you so very much, appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna bring it to close, and I don't wanna impinge on anyone's time. That's uh, probably the most precious thing we give each other. So I would like to close on this idea of the question that I proposed, like what lies beyond democracy? Like what, what lies beyond democracy? And we're all experiencing kind of a degree of agitation about that, certainly in our own country, and I'm so happy to have you here to, to give us your cross piece from your country. But what lies beyond, I would say, the artist is at the center of it. And I'd just be curious to be in conversation with you about that. Uh, because I think that it offers that medium, that way, also the real demonstrated way for us to, to have those hard conversations about the unfinished democracy that we may be experiencing, wherever it may be. So what lies beyond democracy, I'd love to, to know your thoughts on it. And I really appreciate everyone's time here today. And I do not know who I'm handing the mic over to, so please forgive me. Uh, if I... Thank you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Dugal. I'm the chair.
chair of the Center for Cultural Diplomacy here at Meridian. And all I can say is, wow, what an incredible morning of conversations, all thought-provoking, spirited, and I think as one of the panelists said, we have so much more to keep digging in on. Um, I also wanted to congratulate Meridian, Stuart, Natalie, and particularly TK, and his entire team, Sylvie, and so many. I know, because I used to work in the museum field, that it takes truly a village to make these mornings happen. Um, I also wanted to again acknowledge Sue Wrigley for her incredible support for making this happen. And of course, our panelists and our audiences both here and online. Again, I'm the person between us and lunch, so I'm gonna be very quick and just say we hope you'll stay connected with all of us. Um, this beautiful exhibition that you can see in these rooms here and the banners on 16th Street um, hope you'll come back for another look. You can sign up online or through social media channels and stay engaged with us. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.